Hi there and welcome to the two hour tour. This video was recorded in a special session in our church office in May of 2017 and is used as an accompaniment to a two part message that I preached during that same month in church. The intention is to provide an overview of the Bible from the beginning to the end to help you put things in context so that your reading of the Bible becomes a much more enjoyable and understandable experience. Do hope you enjoy this time. So welcome to our two hour tour. We are going to try our best to cover in the course of two hours or so, um, everything in the Bible, an overview of biblical history from the beginning until the end. So this is an audacious, audacious uh, command that we're going to try and do this, but I think we can make it happen. Um, so this is the reason that I've, I've really wanted to do this is because I've been concerned, um, increasingly concerned in the Christian church that I think that we we have a problem with biblical illiteracy and. Um, it's something that I think we need to address as we move forward. When I was first a Christian, maybe 20, 25 years ago, when I first became a Christian, we had um, there was a lot more emphasis on Bible knowledge and Bible learning than, the, than there probably has been in the last 25 years. And I was in a Pentecostal church even. Um, and so part of my desire has been to try to, to deal with that. And, and I want our church and our community that we, that we, we lead and we, our community that we, we're together with, to really, um, really get a good handle on the Bible, because I think that's what will ultimately last us and keep us through life. And so, I've invited you guys there, and you that are watching on video, we've invited you along on the journey, just for the purpose of potentially helping us to get a better overview of the Bible. And uh, one of the reasons for that is that um, I think once we do get an understanding of where everything fits together in the Bible, it makes the whole process of reading it a lot more enjoyable. A lot of people say to me they don't really know they don't enjoy the bible they don't know where to begin sometimes people will say well i understand the new testament but i don't understand the old testament and while it's true that we can understand the message of the gospel the salvation message without having to understand all of the bible history and all that there's so much depth and richness that comes to scriptural understanding when we do get an understanding of some of that other stuff anyone can uh, be taught the scriptures from romans 3:23 and romans 6:23 and understand about salvation but beyond that um, we want Christians who are, are able to mine the riches of the scriptures and get a lot more out of it than what we did. So uh, one of the, the issues that I think leads to this biblical literacy is um, what we call a textbook approach to scripture. This is not actually something that um, was intended when the Bible was written. In the years when the scriptures were written, it wasn't to be read like a textbook. It wasn't to be pulled apart like we would with a university textbook. It was to be uh, read as a story. Essentially, it's supposed to be a story. In fact, before the uh, before written language, things stories were transmitted orally, and that's how, how that's how all these accounts were understood through oral uh, oral transmission. Uh, the whole idea of treating a scripture like a textbook has really only come about in the last five hundred years, with the printing press, and uh, we're going to come to this a bit later on in the night. But with the printing press and the uh, the freedom of people being able to ha have access to the scriptures, which is a wonderful thing, of course, but that was when chapters and verses were first introduced into the scripture. And part of that meant that, aside from the, the, the benefit of being able to find things easily, which is a great benefit, there are lots of benefits with that, but one of the downsides is that it, it kind of led to this textbook approach to scripture. That is, I'll find a text the, a scripture or a verse that fits my situation and I'll just take that verse and use it. The problem with that is it doesn't help with an overview of the story. We tend to just go, okay, we'll take, uh, we'll take John 3.16 and pluck it out and use John 3.16. But John 3.16, as wonderful as that verse is, comes to life so much more when we read it in the context of who the conversation is between, when the conversation is take place, taking place. And we miss all that if we don't view Scripture as a story. So that's become, aside from the, the good things about using chapter and verse and so on for Scriptures, that's been become an issue, that we don't read Scripture as a story. And the risk with that also is it means that we can take Scripture out of context a lot easier. Um, there's a Scripture, I think it's in Proverbs, Proverbs 30 or Proverbs 31, so somewhere there, where if you take two verses, it says, give alcohol to the, give alcohol to the depressed and they'll take away their problems or something like that. And it could be, you could look at that and go, oh, that, that scripture's telling me that I should give alcohol to people who are depressed. 
and you know it'll help them. But when you read it in its context, read the preceding verses and the, the verses afterwards, it's actually saying exactly the opposite of that. It's basically saying you're an idiot if you take alcohol to solve your problems with depression. So they're the sorts of things where we call it proof texting, where we just take this verse and go, that works for me, and we don't look at it in context. And so you go to Bible school, they'll teach you about context. But we just want to come at it from tonight from the perspective of a story. We want to deal with overarching story of Scripture. So within, within Scripture, from the beginning to the end, there is one overarching subject. Would anyone like to guess what that might be? Or could I put it differently? Who that might be? Jesus. Jesus. Very good, Pastor Terry. The main <laughs> overarching subject is Jesus. And Jesus is the central figure of all of Scripture. When Jesus was on the road to Emmaus after his resurrection, he was talking to the disciples, um, to uh, the Cleopas, and we don't know what the other guy's name is. He was chatting with them, and he says he began to talk to them about all the scriptures that spoke about him, starting with Moses, which is the, gen the, the first five books, through all the prophets. He explained all the scriptures that talked about him. So Jesus is the central overarching subject of scripture, which means when we read the Bible... We, we need to read it what we would call Christologically. We need to read it through the lens of what does this show me about who Jesus is. Jesus in John 1, we're going to see that in a moment, is the, is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word. And so Jesus is central. Now, that said, tonight we're not going to spend a lot of time pointing to Jesus because I think once you understand that's the context, to do that, you now if you, if you weren't aware of that, you'll you'll now be aware of that. But tonight, my intention is to look more at the historical context of the scriptures and what happens within the scriptures and, and church history when we get to that, as opposed to pointing everything back to Jesus. The reason I can't do that tonight is we just don't have time. I might occasionally pull a scripture out here and there, but that's we just don't have time to, t to look at all those scriptures tonight. I mean, Jesus took probably two hours. He took his two-hour tour on the road to Emmaus, which is where we got this name from. He took his two-hour tour to explain all those scriptures about him. Tonight, our goal is a bit different. Our goal is to give you an overview of historical historical context of Scripture, which is something that the two guys on the road to Emmaus already knew because they were Jews and they'd been followers of Jesus and they'd spent time around him. So they already knew that stuff. We're, we're assuming that as, uh, as Gentiles, as people who are different late levels of our Christian walk, that we won't all necessarily know that stuff. So we're going to focus on the historical context. And so we've got... That's, that's the four values I want to just address quickly. The value of reading the Bible in, firstly, it's historical context. When we read the Bible that way, through the lens of history, one of the things it does is it helps us to understand the context of um, <clears throat> what was happening in the world when the, when the particular stories that take place were, were actually, you read about those stories, when you know the history behind them, it just helps you to get a broader understanding. And one of the simplest things about that. It's not very spiritual, but one of the simplest things is if you understand the historical context of Scripture, it just makes the reading of Scripture a lot more enjoyable. You actually go, wow, I, I'm enjoying reading this. You know, like no one wants to read a book, a novel that isn't well set, that isn't where, they don't, not where the author doesn't take time to uh, put it in a historical context. So that's why we one of the values of doing the historical context. So tonight we're going to kind of touch on all of these to various different degrees. The textual context, we won't spend as much time on that tonight, but the textual context is understanding the particular uh, books of the Bible and the context of what they, what they were written as. Were they written as historical writing? Was it prophetic writing? Was it um, poetry? Was it song? Because all of those things... When we understand it, that changes how we view the scripture if we understand the textual concepts. Context, it helps us with interpretation. So when the scriptures say that, you know, the, the Lord hides us under the shadow of his wings, we need to realize that he's talking allegorically there. He's, you know, that's not saying that God has feathers. We understand the context by which, by which he's saying that. So understanding that helps us a little bit. In fact, people who start cults generally, that's what they do. One of the first things they do is take scripture out of context. And make it say whatever they want it to say because they're not taking the time to explain context. It's sociological context. So sociological context means to understand what's going on sociologically in the world at that time. What empire is in control at the particular time it's being written? Were the people under slavery? Were they independent? Uh, what was it? was it? Were they rich? Were they poor? All those kind of contexts all help with that. So sociological, uh, we, otherwise what happens is we tend to read everything through the 21st century lens because that's what we understand. 
Or we go the other way and go, oh, that's all ancient context. So we, we think we're doing well when we read scripture through ancient context. But we've got to realize that we're reading about scriptures that were written over a period of about 2,000 years. Now, you think about how much culture has changed in the last 2,000 years. So we would be foolish to assume that just because we read something in the book of Genesis, that the context sociologically is the same as when we read something in the book of Matthew, because the context has changed. Society has changed. Culture has changed during that time. And so understanding sociological context is important. And lastly, this is one that's fairly new to me, I have to say, um, the geographical context. Because I'm heading off to Israel shortly, I've spent a lot of time understanding, uh, re researching the geography, the geographical context of Scripture. And as I've done that, I have found a new level of depth and richness in Scripture that I've never seen before. There's a, a, a lot of events that when you read about them and you kind of understand the geography of the land that it's written in, what's taking place, uh, what countries and where they are, and uh, <clears throat> all of the geography that goes with that, it just gives richness to the scripture again. So it's very similar to the historical context when we get a handle on the geographical context. Um, and we'll do a little bit of that. I'm going to show you a little bit of geography, I'm not expecting that you'll necessarily take it all in, but we will, we will touch on some of the geography as we move forward. And don't worry, we won't spend as much time as we have on the first screen, okay? Otherwise, we will really be here till 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> we won't do that, So, um, but just to give you a bit of an introduction. So understanding that geographical context helps. So before we move on, I wanted to just show you a few tools that I put here that you might be interested. If you, if you want to get a better understanding on Scripture, I've just got a selection of books. One of them that I really wanted to have, I don't have, and that's because I lent it to my daughter. Um, if you are wanting to learn Scripture, the first one, before I look at these other ones, um, some of you have heard me mention this before, the best recommendation I can get if you want to learn Scripture in its historical context is get yourself a good children's Bible. She told me I've got it at home. You've got it at home, have you? There you go. A good children's Bible is worth worth doing. If you can find one, Not we're not talking about learn your ABCs for you know new beginners, but get one that you would expect to read to you know a 10 or 11 year old that's got the stories in there. If it's a good one, you'll actually go through the major historical stories. And it's amazing if you do that, when you go back to reading the full scriptures, how enlightening it is when you go, oh, I understand how the pieces all fit together. And a story will actually do that. Um, the story, a children's Bible will do that as well as, as, well as um, I'm going to do it tonight. I'm probably much better than I'm going to do it tonight. So a children's Bible. Now, just to show you a couple of other selections here. This one here is, uh, I mentioned Abigail and Church yesterday, and I'm offering a message. So I haven't actually read this one. This is Jill's one. This is what they call biblical historical fiction. So these are, these are uh, fiction writers who have taken the time to research historically and uh, have written a fictional novel based around a biblical character. Okay, and So this lady, Jill Olin Smith, she's got, I think this is the Wives of David series. So she's got all the different Wives of David. And she builds, the, builds a whole novel on the story of Abigail around that. So obviously there's a lot of um, literary license. But what, that, what these writers, historical writers do, fascinating reading if you like fiction. Um, the other ones, my favourite ones, are the, the books by a couple called the Taneys, T-H-O-E-N-E. -E. Spelled, it's pronounced Taney, but it sort of it doesn't look anything like it. T-H-O-E-N-E. -E. And uh, Thaney, is that right? Thoaney is how it sounds. Thoaney is how it sounds, but it's pronounced Taney, isn't it? Taney. And uh, they've got a whole series. In fact, the series that my favourite series is all around the life of the ministry of Jesus. And each of these different story, each of these different books comes from a different character. So an entire book about Zacchaeus, the tax collector, building up around everything that's happening in Jericho during the time Jesus is coming. So historical fiction is fantastic for that. This one here, um, there's two books that I have. This one called The Book of Books. This is my favorite. And there's another one called The, uh, called the Book of God, I think it's called. Now this is... Basically, the best way to put this is this is the Bible retold. So this is they've taken the Bible and put it into a novel. So you can read this, the main stories of the Bible from beginning to end in novel form. Okay, so once again, quite a bit of literary license, but it's obviously not building on the depth they are with that, which is like, you know, one woman and one Bible chapter or two chapters. This is the whole Bible in a novel form. Okay, so it's a good way to just get you an overview on the Bible. Uh, there's a New Christian's Handbook, lots of different things like that. They'll just give you a good overview if you're starting out in the faith from scratch. Great thing what to do with this. If you want to get a bit more Bible college, a, new, uh, a survey. You can get uh, New Testament surveys and Old Testament surveys. These are like an encyclopedia that tend to follow through from beginning to end. But they'll mix 
rich historical, textual, sociological, and geographical all together. Written, usually written by scholars, but written in a form that you don't need to be a scholar to understand. Okay, so there's, there's those four um, for that. These little simple kind of books like this, uh, Essential Bible Reference, these are like DK Learning kind of books. You remember, you might have seen those, a teacher or whatever, DK Learning. And you can see this is just the story of the Bible. And so it's written in quite a simple form. You can learn a lot of information and lots of pictures, that sort of thing. And then over here, uh, what's this one? Cover to Cover. So that's a book by Selwyn Hughes who wrote the message. That is an overview in a whole day and a whole year, uh, pretty much a whole year with uh, an overview of uh, main stories in the Bible with probably similar to a survey, but written a little bit less, less uh, archaeologically. A journey through the Bible. This one will be focused largely on historical and geographical. So you can see pictures and all that sort of stuff in there. And uh, a great one if you is the, is a Bible dictionary. You don't interestingly enough for this one you can just get this on your phone for next to nothing these days. I carry on my phone like an entire bookshelf more than I've got at home. A Bible dictionary is a good tool to have whether it's a digital one or not. What a Bible dictionary does is just like any dictionary, it's an alphabetical order from A to Z, and any place name or person or significant event. You can just look it up. So I can just go to D for David, look up David, and I'll just, it'll just give me all the scriptures and all the story and all the explanation about who David is. Okay, so it's a good tool to have. Diseases of the Bible. So all kinds of things. So a Bible dictionary is a good tool. So they're just good things that can help you. And then what I've got down here on the floor is a, is a Bible timeline. This is actually, I've had this one for a few years now, and it's a, it's a bit tattered. It tends, it's been taped on my wall, blue taped on my wall on and off over several occasions tends to tend to fall down in the summer months because the blue tape doesn't hold in the heat. Again, it falls on the ground and smashes and tears. But what this is, you can buy these actually at Kurong for, well, Graham, how much did you buy? 25 bucks or something? Oh, less than that. Less than that, than that. yeah. We could so, Costco. Costco, there you go. <laughs> so this is, this is half. Nicole, do you want to just grab the other end and we'll just show these guys. I'll just pull, close on a bit. So this is, this is half of it. So this was done, actually done a long time ago, back before the, back before the, the computer age. This guy spent his, a lot of his life doing it. And so what we have here is a main timeline, according to the Bible timeline, from the beginning all the way through to the time. I think this finishes at about 1900, I think. Uh, that's when it was done, about 100 years ago or something, originally. And uh, what we have is a, the main Bible characters here. So, for instance, you get to see the, the ages, and you can see Adam is 930 years. So he dies there. One of the things that interests, amazes me is that Noah there is born within about 100 years of Adam dying. Or Noah's son, Seth, he, he, he dies 10 years before Noah is born. So when you, when you get that sort of context, you realise that um, things are quite interesting. It just helps you, with, helps you get some biblical understanding, some context. So that's just, obviously, you need to have a pretty big wall to put that up on, which I don't have anymore. I tried putting it on my wall in my office, but as I said, it fell down and it had to put it in two sections. So it's just a useful tool. So we're going to get into the... Actual study now. So we're going to begin with the beginning. So the topics for beginning, um, and we have just a variety of different topics, signposts if you like, which are across the top here, that we'll just sort of touch base on these each of these as we move through the night. So the beginning, looking at creation, Eden, and sin. First thing we need to know is that there is actually a beginning before the beginning. So Genesis chapter 1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Correct? So we assume that's the beginning. But really, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, is actually the beginning before the beginning. John chapter 1, verse 1 to 4 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through Him. Nothing was made that has been made, if not through God. It's a basically, before God created everything else, we go even before that to the other beginning, which actually is, John is saying, in the very beginning, before the beginning, existed Jesus. He, it's, it's a claim to the divinity of Christ. That Jesus was the eternal word of God. Before God created anything, Jesus existed. And John tells us that everything that was made was made through Jesus. He was involved in all of creation. So that's the beginning before the beginning. So uh, when people sometimes talk to you about, they'll say, oh, Matthew's genealogy uh, at the very beginning of Matthew, there's a genealogy of the life of Jesus. And in the book of Luke, there's a, I think about chapter 3, there's a genealogy of the life of Jesus. And they're, they're quite they're significant in their difference. One goes from uh, Matthew through to, go, so it goes from Abraham through to Jesus to trace the lineage of 
of Jesus as a Jew. And that was Matthew. He was writing to Jewish people. Luke, who was writing to Gentiles, he traces the genealogy backwards from Luke all the way back to Adam to show that Jesus was the son of man. He was, he was the descendant of all humanity and was able to save all humanity. But there is a third genealogy, actually, and that's the John chapter 1 genealogy. It just talks about the eternity of Christ. That he actually, what the other two deal with his human lineage. This deals with his eternal Godhead lineage in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. So the Trinity was involved in creation. We haven't got time to go there, but you'll see that scriptures are very clear that any act of God, creative act of God, is actually refer, refers to being done by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three are involved. In fact, any of the attributes of God, any of the divine attributes of God, all power, all knowing, um, all, uh, you know, uh, all the omniscient, omniscient, what's the other one? Omni, all, all power, omniscient, all knowing, and everywhere, om, omnipresent, everywhere. All those other attributes of God, you will find attributed to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit somewhere in Scripture. That's intentionally done by the Holy Spirit as he's inspired Scripture to show us that he was involved in all, all of them. Next point is... Was it seven days or was it 14 billion years? Okay, is, and, and is, that, is that actually important? Is it seven days or 14 billion years? So I have this question. It always comes up with my year seven scripture class. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm not going to presume to tell you what you should believe. Okay, um, I personally don't presume to be an expert on this, but I have done a reasonable amount of research and watched a reasonable amount of uh, of studies and studies and I, I think there's a there's actually a reasonable amount of evidence scientific evidence to say that the earth isn't 14 billion years old that it's it's six thousand six thousand years old that the creation story genealogically actually takes place in that in that account now i'm not going to go into that tonight um and is it really important well those those who believe still believe in the creation account there are people christians who believe that the earth is, could still be 14 billion years old but they still believe in the events of the Garden of Eden. They just say that there is a, a time that took place, an undetermined amount of time between the creation of Adam and Eve in the garden and the beginning. The create In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 14 billion years later, he created Adam. Okay, so that's, that's where that context fits in. But as Christians, um, you will face this thing. Does it actually matter? Is the whole event of the Garden of Eden actually take did it actually take place or is it just an allegory and is that important well i would posit to you that it's absolutely vitally important that we believe that god did create adam that adam really was a real person it wasn't just an allegory the reason is our entire faith hangs on that the issue of sin hangs on that the issue that the issue that sin entered the world at that point hangs on the fact of disobedience if otherwise where does sin come from if we just evolve from apes where does sin come from so and the other, the other thing is, I tend to say that I'm a Christian, therefore I follow what Jesus says. Well, Jesus believed in Adam and Eve, so then I'm going to believe what Jesus believed. I'm going to choose to believe what Jesus believed, and I can't go wrong. So without spending much time on that, I would say, yes, it does matter. And the reason it matters is because that's where sin came from. That's where the problem arose with human nature. If we, didn't, <clears throat> if we just evolved as sinful beings at some point, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, because we really, if we really are descended from apes by virtue of chance and no design or anything like that, then there's no moral issue here. We don't, we're not moral beings anymore. We're just beings that have, um, just, just don't have morals. We're just like an, an animal that just uses instinct. But scripture teaches us that we are moral beings. We are created to obey a moral law by God. And so it really does matter to the whole Garden of Eden situation. And, and I'm assuming that most people will know that story. So, and those are in church recently. We've gone through that in some great depth. So just to finish off on that, the whole issue of the creation and the Garden of Eden, the story that took place there, is that that is where we get the foundational problem, sin. Sin comes from disobedience to God in the Garden by Adam. And then it's in the Garden of Eden where we see the proto-evangelium, the first, the first proto-first evangel. The first message of the gospel is actually God the Father himself meeting with Adam and Eve, and speaking to Eve and prophesying about that Eve's seed would defeat the serpent's seed and would crush his head. That's God in the very first instance declaring the evangelist. And from that moment on in Scripture, that's what the rest of the Bible is about. The Bible is about everything pointing towards this one, this seed, this descendant of Eve who would come and crush the devil's head. 
the whole of the Old Testament context up till the time of Christ has to be understood within that context of that is the battle that's raging behind the scenes. It's a battle where the devil and his seed are trying to destroy the woman's seed before the woman's seed comes into the world to destroy him. Okay, Everything else makes context. And so to take that out or to say that's just allegory, nothing makes sense. We're going we're gonna to completely dissolve everything that the scripture has to say to us. So after a period of time, sin and, and all that takes place. Now historically, according to this, and if you were just to simply take the, the Bible account and the dates and the ages, the creation of the world was about 4000 BC. Okay, so about that time. The um, flood takes place um, about 1100 years later. Okay, so we're going to look at, briefly at the flood. This takes place about 2950 BC. And how was that? 1050 years later or something like that. Um, and the flood basically is a new, we, we had the flood, Noah's Ark, and then the new beginning. So what brought about the flood? Well, at that point, after a thousand years of men living for 900 odd years, living in their sin, the world is just going, perpetuating downhill. A lot of people, obviously in 900 years, they have a lot of kids. They just keep having children and sin just gets worse and worse and worse to the point where it's out of control. So long lives and licentious living. They're living and sin is just getting worse and worse and uh, things are out of hand. Humanity is in a mess at this point. Now, this other topic that comes up that's important that we need to come back to is this topic of what the Bible calls the Nephilim. Has anyone heard of the Nephilim before? Mm -hmm. Who's heard of the Nephilim? What, are, what do you know about the Nephilim, Claire? I've heard it's an alien conspiracy. An alien conspiracy. Okay. So the Nephilim in Scripture, the Nephilim, uh, the Bible tells us who these Nephilim are. Ne uh, in your version, it probably says giants. If it's, you know, a lot of versions say giants. Now, there were giants, but that's not what the word means. Nephilim actually is um, a Hebrew word, um, which means fallen ones, fallen ones. And we read about this. In the, in, interesting, the reason I've linked it in with the Noah account is that's where we first read about the Nephilim. The Nephilim, it says, in those days, it says that the sons of God took the daughters of, daughters of men and had children by them. Now, the sons of God there is, um, is biblically speaking, um, there are schools of thought that try to say the sons of God are actually the sons of Seth, Adam's son Seth, but it doesn't fit with scripture. These are the more traditional conservative Bible colleges and seminaries. Um, and, but that belief has only just been around for the last couple of hundred years. Before that, it was commonplace that Nephilim took place. And so the scripture tells us the sons of God, the other, term the, son, the other time the sons of God is used is actually used in the book of Job when it says the sons of God, the demons, came and presented themselves before God. So sons of God meaning those who are created direct creations of God is actually what sons of God means. And so the Nephilim doctrine actually teaches that as weird as this sounds, this is why I've written, it's weird, but the, the Nephilim doctrine actually teaches that demonic beings actually uh, had children by women. And these demonic beings created hybrid spirit beings. Now, before that sounds totally weird and just dismiss it, just think about every, um, every religious belief, mythological belief, that you can come across, whether it's Greek mythology, Roman mythology, you can go to South American theology, mythology. In virtually every religious mythology of the world, you will find what they call demigod beings, half angelic, half human. The, all the, all the, the Roman demigods, that's what they were. They were pr products of the, the gods and the humans. So this belief exists in every, every uh, major religion. And theologically, what that talks about is that, that really, the way it fits is that the, de the devil was trying to destroy the seed of the woman because that's where the seed was coming from. If, so if he can distort the, wheat, the seed of the woman, he can foil the plan of God, the prophecy of God that the seed would produce one, meaning Jesus, who would defeat him. So we see this Nephilim comes. And so a lot of theologians believe that's actually what the flood was about at that point to, to basically start again. So when it says, Noah was a righteous man in his generation. Now, that could mean that he was righteous as in his behavior. It could mean that. It probably does mean that. But it also it can also mean his bloodline was pure. The same word. He was a pure bloodline. Otherwise, he was untainted by this Nephilim. Okay? So these Nephilim, uh, these giants, these, it talks about them being men of renown. These were military leaders. They were tall men. They were giants. But that's where it comes, it comes from. So the earth was flooded. Now, the interesting thing about the Nephilim is that 
they started again because it actually says the Nephilim in Genesis 6, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and afterwards. And we see them again. Can anyone think who the most famous Nephilim giant may be in the entire Bible? Goliath. He's the sons of Anak, the Anakites. The Anakites, it refers to them. When the, we're going to see when Joshua and Caleb go into the promised land, they say the Anakites were there, the Nephilim were there. And we were like grasshoppers compared to them. They were giants compared to us. The Anakites, the, the Nephilim were back in the land again. Now, the bit where you mentioned the alien conspiracy. So there are people who believe that that actually could be what the whole alien abduction thing is about. Now, it's speculatory. It does have some credence, if that's what's really going on. Because most people, if you, if you go to the... You go to the whole NASA archives and look at all that sort of stuff. There is talk there about the fact that generally one of the things that women who say they're abducted is, is normally these aliens are, are experimenting on their reproductive organs. So it's possible that these aliens are actually demonic beings and they are experimenting for the purpose of reproduction. It's speculatory, um, but it's not worth completely dismissing. What I'd say is don't build doctrine on stuff that's speculatory. Okay, that's, that's what I'd say. When people start to become obsessed with... With speculation, they're on shaky ground. I'd say it's not necessary. If God wanted us to know it, he 100%, he would have told us. Okay, there might come a time when we do need to know that, but not now. So God decides to start again. And so he floods the earth. And he's actually, he floods the earth. Noah, contrary to popular belief, the uh, Noah wasn't in the ark for 40 days and 40 nights. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. So Noah and his family were actually in the ark for over a year. By the time, I think it's 370 days or something by the time that the floodwaters subsided. And then we have what we call the Noahic Covenant, Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 9, 17. And we haven't got time to look at it. You can look at it in your own time. But it's basically God's covenant. And in that covenant, he reinstates some of the original covenant that he made with Adam. To Adam, he said, fill the earth, multiply, subdue the earth, rule the earth. Interestingly enough, that Noah's covenant is fill the earth, subdue the earth but no mention of rule the earth because those who have heard recently that, that, that in the garden of eden when the devil deceived eve and tempted adam he took away the right to rule the earth it, so it's not mentioned in the noahic covenant um, so there's no sense of rulership or dominion at that point for noah but there is still a subduing of the earth and making it work for them and 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 working hard and ruling over the animals and using the animals for their their gain so god reinstated that and every covenant in the bible a covenant is just an agreement. So a biblical term for an agreement. We might use it like a, con a contract today is what a covenant is. And generally, I think probably without exception, every covenant is sealed with a sign. So today, when we have a contract, we use a stamp or a signature to sign a covenant, to sign a contract of any kind. So every covenant was signed by the people who were involved in the covenant. The Noahic covenant had a special sign. Does anybody know what the sign is? Yes, go, Pastor Terry. The rainbow. the rainbow is absolutely correct. That is the sign. God sealed his covenant with a sign and said, every time you see the rainbow, it will be a sign to you of everything I have promised you. And part of that is that I will never again flood the earth completely. Okay? That does not mean there will not come a time when God will not destroy the earth and start again. It's just the next time he does that, he will do it through fire, is what Scripture says, not through a flood. Okay? That's still to become. It's still to come when God brings the final judgment. But that's the sign of the Noahic covenant. So where did they go after the ark? Well, there's a bit of conjecture about where they went. Um, I don't think I wrote down where they all went. Um, but let me see if I've got some notes on that. No, uh, yes, I did, I did have some notes here. So there's tradition, there's a lot of speculation, but um, these are, this is probably the closest thing to a consensus that, that historians and historical Biblical historic historians come up with. Ham, there's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So Ham, it says, became the descendant of the Africans and the Asian people. Shem became, which is the word we get Semitic from, the Semitic. So they became the Middle Eastern people. So Shem was the Middle Eastern people, and Japheth was the white Europeans. Okay, so Ham was the Africans and Asians, Shem the Middle Easterns, and Japheth the white Europeans. So I certainly wouldn't say that that's historically accurate enough we weren't there scriptures don't explain that but there's just some evidence that seems to they seem to be able to use that says that's where it's come from but basically they spread out across the earth which was part of what they were told to do following the the um the coming out of the ark 
Uh, question people ask is you can't fit all those animals in the ark. There's no way you could fit all the animals in the ark. Well, I want to show you very quickly that yes, you can. In fact, you can very easily. So if you turn over the page, you'll see here that uh, this is a diagram that uh, Graham Clemson would be familiar with because we used this, this diagram many years ago in, in, uh, in my um, your ground, of course. This is actually a, def a description of the ark using the measurements that the Bible uses. So the, the, uh, traditionally, a cubit was the distance from an elbow to the fingertip or there is some times when it was the elbow to the wrist. So in this particular measurement, see, we've used the elbow to the wrist to be conservative. So we've, it's about 30, conservatively about 45 centimetres. It could probably be closer to 60 centimetres. But if you, even if you go at that and use the biblical definition of 300 cubits long and 50 cubits wide and three decks, you end up with this. 135 metre boat, 23 metres wide, 14 metres, a total volume that is a, equivalent to a train approximately 13 kilometres long. So what they've been able to show is that you actually fit the animals in one third of the amount of space for the ark. Okay, so no problems whatsoever. And that's allowing for species that have been extinct. Okay, so the ark was easily, you know, it wasn't invented later. It was, it was able to do what it said it could do. Um, the ark was specially built with a shape. It wasn't unlike most boats that are built with a bow to go somewhere. The ark, the design of the ark was actually built just to float. It's actually designed to float. That's, it's most stable. It won't capsize because of the shape of it, which is what it needed to do. It didn't need to go anywhere. God was going to make it stop where he wanted it to stop. But uh, it was designed for that purpose. Okay, so they came out of the ark. And then moving forward to the next chapter in our history of our overview, we have the patriarchs. So this, is, this happens uh, with about a thousand years or thereabouts after the ark experience. Okay, so we've jumped ahead another thousand years to around about 2000 BC. Okay, and from here on in, the history line starts to condense, and the rest of the new, the Old Testament takes place in in this period of 2000 BC. So we're going to talk briefly about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph to a lesser extent. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. So Abraham. The Bible calls him the father of faith, a significant biblical figure that we do need to know a lot about in order to understand a lot of the teaching in the New Testament because a lot of the book of Galatians, a lot of the book of Hebrews refers at length to this man, Abraham. So his name was originally Abram and it was changed by God to Abraham when he received the Abrahamic covenant. And the Abrahamic covenant uh, is a promise that God gives to him in Genesis chapter 12, and reiterates it again in Genesis chapter 15. And that promise is, among other things, that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him. He would be a blessing. He would be blessed by God. All the nations would be blessed through him. And those who bless him will be blessed, and those who curse him will be cursed. So a significant figure. Abraham is a, is a main player in understanding biblical history. His name was changed from Abram to Abraham, and his wife's name was changed from Sarai to Sarah. What do you notice about both of those name changes? What's the significant letter? H, absolutely. Does anyone know why, what the H represents? The, the H is actually um, the Hebrew word, Hebrew letter, ruach. It's the breath represents spirit. So when we say Abraham, we breathe, ham. It's the H, Sarah, not Sarai. So H became the Hebrew letter for H. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. It actually refers to breath. So anytime you see that, it's a picture of the Holy Spirit. So when, God's na when God changed Abram's name to Abraham, he breathed into him new life. Okay, so H, the breath. Okay, so that will help you. Even some basic rudimentary understanding of, of Hebrew letters actually helps you even with some of our names. Um, you'd be amazed how many of our, our English names have God's name in them. Think about it, Daniel. L appears in so many of our names, so many um, of our modern day names. So a lot of these letters come from Hebrew, have their roots in the Hebrew language. So God breathed into Abraham, changed him. So Abraham, Abraham's journey... We'll come back to that on the next slide. In fact, we'll go over to that slide and then we'll come back. Abraham's journey, a bit, of, a bit of geography for you now. Abraham was descended, his father, Terah, lived in uh, basically 
somewhere over here. Susa, no, no, okay. somewhere over this side. So what we have here is, is an overview of the Middle Eastern region of the world. We're going to look at this several times during the course of the night. Abraham was over here, and he, his father, Terah, was called to move. And so Terah moved from where he was living, which is Ur, there it is, Ur, all the way down there near the Persian Gulf. It's probably in modern-day Kuwait, actually, or thereabouts, or the extreme near the end of Iraq where it meets Kuwait. And he moved, he was told to move. So Terah moved from there to Haran, there. And then he settled there with his sons. And, uh, and then what happened was, after Terah died, God spoke to Abraham and called him and said, Abraham, I want you to get up, take your family, and go to the land I will show you. And so after living there for some time, Abraham took himself and his herds and flocks and his uh, nephew Lot, and they moved from there down into what is modern-day Canaan or modern-day Israel. Okay, and this is where the bulk of the bulk of biblical history obviously takes place in the nation of Israel and what is today the nation of Jordan. We'll have a look at that as well. So that's a bit of an account. This um, this band of green through here, you will have heard this if you've done any study in ancient history. You may have heard the term the Fertile Crescent. Has anyone heard the term the Fertile Crescent? The reason is is because if you look at a geographical map, you'll see that this is the Arabian Desert, and uh, this is Saudi Arabia. This is desert right across here right throughout the Sinai Peninsula and southern Israel, it's all desert. Okay, so this is the Fertile Crescent. It's fertile because there's water there. This is the Euphrates River. And so even though the distance from here to here is quite short, they wouldn't travel that way. They always traveled via the Fertile Crescent because in ancient times, they obviously water was important. So they needed to take, uh, you know, stay by the water sources. So God called Abraham and took him to this land, this promised land, that he would later become the, the founder of what is now modern Israel. So we'll just go back to those slides. So Abraham, after a period of time, has two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac is the, the second-born son, but he's the child of the promise. He's the one that God promised, and he came supernaturally to Sarah in her old age. Ishmael was born as it become a picture of human striving and struggling. Ishmael was born through Sarah giving his her uh, handmaid, to Abraham, he slept with her, and as a result of that, had Ish Ishmael. Ishmael is, uh, as I say, a picture of human sh human effort. Isaac is a picture of promise. And to understand that, it helps you to understand some of the book of Galatians, because the Apostle Paul teaches a lot about Isaac and Ishmael in the book of Galatians. Uh, Isaac had two sons himself by the name of Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the one whose name was changed to Israel. So he is the, the, the founder, the founding father, if you like, of the nation of Israel. His other son, his, his other brother, Esau, they were twin brothers. Esau was the firstborn. He was born first. But Jacob uh, actually once again was the promised, even though he was the younger one. He was the promised one. Um, and Paul, the Apostle Paul also addresses that same principle in the New Testament. Esau, <coughs> excuse me, Esau became uh, the descendant of, through which the Edomites, you'll read about the Edomites in the Bible a lot. And the Edomites generally lived, they lived just to the immediate west of the nation of the land of Canaan. Okay, And so you'll often see scriptures that say, uh, it'll, poetically it'll say, uh, Edom, e Edom your brother. And that's what it's referring to, the fact that the Edomites were the closest relatives to the Israelites because they were actually, Israel and Esau were actually brothers. Okay, so it just helps to understand some of that. Jacob had 12 sons, and we haven't got time to go into all the stories, but this is the overview. Jacob had 12 sons, of, and basically those 12 sons, for the sake of explanation, became the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, um, we'll have a look at a moment. You'll see it's not exactly that, because Joseph was one of those 12 sons. He was number 11 of the 12 sons. And he's the one who went down into Egypt as a slave and ended up being the prime minister of Egypt and became the deliverer of um, all of the of his family at that time. And his family came and joined him. Uh, Jacob, as an old man, came with all his descendants and they lived in the land of Goshen, which is actually the most fertile area. This, this is the Nile River here, and this is the land of Goshen here. It's a floodplain, basically, that empties out the Nile into the Mediterranean Sea. That's where the people, the Jews, lived when they were in in Egypt at that time. That's where Israel lived in Egypt. And um, Jacob had Jacob had those sons. Joseph became uh, number 11 son. But when Joseph, uh, when Jacob was dying and he was prophesying over his 12 sons, he actually took Joseph's two sons, um, Ephraim and Manasseh, 
and he adopted them as his sons. So he adopted his grandsons as his sons. And so Ephraim and Manasseh actually went up a level, gene geologic, uh, ge sorry, genealogically, went up a level and became tribes as well. So if you take it that way, Joseph actually represents two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh, which means that there's not 12 tribes, there's how many? 13 tribes. Okay. Okay, so we'll probably come to that in a moment. So the next slide, I just threw this in. It's not in your book. I threw this in this afternoon just to show you quickly. This is just a modern Google Maps uh, version of what Israel looks, what the, the Middle East looks like today. Okay, it's just to give you some perspective. So um, the nation of the land of Canaan is everything here. So what we have really small here is this is the Sea of Galilee. This is the Dead Sea, the small, the lowest place on the face of the planet, and uh, everything to the west of that is regarded as the land of Canaan when you read the Bible. Most biblical history takes place on both sides of the Jordan River. So a lot of the land of Israel in, in Bible days was actually what is now the land of Jordan. It's a different country. It's now an Islamic country, but it's actually a lot of this belonged to Israel as well. Okay, So you can see from this that this is Syria here. Now, most of the problems are, are way up north here, but you can see that Syria and Israel actually share a border, even still today. And that, that border is the Golan Heights. So you might have heard about that in the news. You hear about it regularly. That's where um, that belonged to Syria, and Israel took that back in 1967. Um, there's a lot of dotted lines here. This is the Golan Heights. This little bit down here is the Gaza Strip. These are things you all hear about in the news, and this is the West Bank, which you hear about all the time. Just flick on the news, and you'll hear about West Bank. These areas are, are currently under dispute. This one here, the West Bank, is currently under dispute. The Palestinians say it belongs to them. Palestinians are... They claim to be the Philistines. That's where the word it sounds like that. That's the biblical Philistines are now, historically, supposedly the Palestinians. Okay, so this is modern day Israel and Jordan, just to give you an overview a little bit of where all the biblical stories fit together. So the next slide is the patriarchal family tree. You don't, I'll just, you won't look at the whole thing, but I'll just go through a couple of things. So Terah had. Uh, three sons, Haran, Nahor, and Abram. Abraham married Sarai and had Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac uh, married Rebekah and had, uh, where are they? He, uh, married Rebekah and had Jacob. Jacob through Leah, his wife, sorry, through Rachel and Leah, his wives, and their two concubines had Joseph and all the brothers, all the tribes of Israel. So the Arab nations of the world today what we regard as Arab nations, so all those other nations that I just showed you, apart from Israel, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, uh, Iraq, Iran, those are the Arabic nations, uh, Turkey, uh, um, Lebanon, they are descended from Ishmael and Esau. Esau actually married an Ishmaelite. He went to just upset his parents. He went and married an Ishmaelite, so he became a descendant of um, of the Arab people of today. So those those things are still being played out in history today, when you open up, listen to CNN, we're dealing with issues, biblical issues that have been around since since these times, since patriarchal times. Essentially, the problems in the Middle East exist because Israel, the nation of Israel, believed they had a right to be there because God gave them the right to be there, even though most of, most of Jewish people in the nation today aren't really uh, God-fearing people. They're a secular nation, by and large. But they believe they have a right to be there because it's God's promise to them through Abraham that they would have that land. The Palestinians and the Arab people say, you have no right to be there. Palestinians say, well, we were here first because they say they were the Philistines and they came first. So there's, you've just got this mix up. And to say anyone to presumes they could solve that is probably kidding themselves because it is, a, it is a very, very complex issue. And in the midst of it are a lot of innocent people on both sides that get caught up in this whole process. So that's the, the tribes of Israel. There we are. Leah had Reuben, Simeon, Levi. We haven't got time to look at all those tribes. The main ones you need to know about for biblical history is the priestly tribe, the Levites, the royal tribe, Judah, which is son number four, and then we've Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Joseph, who has Manasseh and Ephraim, who will also become tribes. Dinah is written in dot. That's their sister there. You might have read, read that story in the book of Genesis, uh, the story of Dinah. And so, NB, in effect, there are actually 13 tribes, and whenever they're listed in the Bible, they're in a different order. There's always one missing. Okay, and there's significance as you read them as to what that might be. So sometimes Levi will be left out because Levi didn't actually occupy any land. They were the priestly tribe. And so there's all kinds of reasons why, because there's several listings of the, of the uh, tribes within Scripture. 
And when you study them closely, you'll see some of those reasons. Now, this next slide, I think I've got this a couple of times, this kind of just shows you a breakdown of the land. So um, we'll come back to this when we do the Exodus in a, in a few moments. But this shows the breakdown of the land and how it was divided up when they took the land. So as you can see, you've got Dead Sea, and you've got the Sea of Galilee there. And uh, Judah predominantly had land south. They look like they've got a lot of land, but a lot of this is desert. Okay, that's the, the Negev, or the wilderness where Jesus was tempted down south. It's, it's on a par with Saudi Arabia, so most of this is just desert down here. This is very lush, lush and fertile up around the Sea of Galilee and further north. So that you can just see the, the breakdown of how the land was allocated to the different tribes. But God's original intention was actually, the plan was that they would have everything this side of the Jordan. But when they were in the desert for 40 years, they actually conquered this part of the land. And you read about some, these guys, the leaders of these tribes come and they say to Moses, hey, we like this side of the land, can we stay here? And Moses says, okay, you can stay there, provided you promise to come and help us conquer the other side. You can go across and conquer the other side, then you can come back. Okay? So none of that belongs to Israel today. That's all the land of Jordan today. Uh, it comes from Transjordan, meaning across the Jordan, meaning the Jordan River. Okay? This is another geographical breakdown. Is it important? It's, it's helpful if you get an understanding of this. So this is a, a um, looking at it from a, from a uh, elevation perspective. We have the Sharon Plain, the Rose of Sharon, and lots of scriptures talk about the Shane of, Pla the, of the, the Sharon Plain, which is on the coast of the Mediterranean. It's flat, and it's about, about 10, 15 kilometers straight across there, flat pl plain land. Then it heads up into the mountains, and Jerusalem is up in the hills, and this, this is called the hill country. You often hear the scriptures talk about the hill country of Ephraim or the hill country of Manasseh. Usually what that's referring to is this band of hill country through here, the central mountain range. Okay, And then it drops down the other side into the Jordan Valley, which is the river that runs from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea, down below, well below the sea level, the lowest point on the face of the planet. And then it rises up again onto the hill country of Transjordan, the mountains on this side, and then out into the desert, which is Saudi Arabia in the desert. Way up north here, Mount Hermon is actually right on the border with Lebanon today. And you scriptures talk about Mount Hermon. It's actually the it's actually the beginning of the place where the waters flow off Mount Hermon to flow into the Jordan River to the Sea of Galilee and then down into um, the Dead Sea. So it says Psalm 133. So it talks about how blessed it is when the brethren dwell together in unity. It's like the dew of Mount Hermon and things like this. So the, the water flow, the source of water flow, comes down from way up here. This is, uh, this is 9,000 9, feet, I think it is, above sea level. We're talking about, you know, hot, about 3,000 metres or something like that above sea level, dropping down to like 1,000 metres below sea level. It would be like going from higher than Kosciuszko to sea level in the space of about 40 kilometres. It's a very, very downhill. It'd be good for riding your bikes. You wouldn't want to be riding back up there, but coming down would be a lot of fun. If you want to go riding, a lot of people do actually. They ride their bikes yeah. down the Jordan Valley. It's a very, cycling is a very big thing in, in Israel. Good. Some great cycling up through there. So if you understand some of that, it just helps with understanding some of the figures of speech that are used in Scripture. Okay, um, These are places like Jabbok River you'll often see. You'll often mention the Arnon Gorge is mentioned all the time in Scripture. This is a big gorge that comes in and feeds into the Dead Sea here. Massive big gorge. Um, what's some other places that are common? that come up in, in scripture. Oh, Mount Carmel, high up, where's where Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. The Jezreel Valley, which runs from Mount Carmel through here. Heaps and heaps and heaps of biblical stuff happens in Jezreel Valley. Nazareth is in there. Armageddon is in there, or Megiddo as it's called today. The Battle of Armageddon takes place. You'll often hear about the Jezreel Valley. Okay, so that's it. Just to understand some of where it all fits together. And when you're reading the scripture, just take some time to stop and familiarize yourself with the geography. It's worth doing because it will actually bring the scripture to life a little bit. We might do the Exodus and then we'll have a quick break. All right. So after Joseph and his, and his uh, descendants, his father and all their family go into, uh, into the land of, uh, of Egypt to live there, the Exodus is the next major story. Moses, Moses, the desert, and the law. Slaves in Egypt. As you would probably know, if you know much of the scriptures, you know that there was a period of time where they were enslaved in Egypt. And it says, in those days, another Pharaoh arose. So when they first went there, they were invited by Pharaoh. Joseph was a friend of Pharaoh. He was his prime minister. 
And they were invited to come down and have the best of the land. But it says another pharaoh came who knew nothing. There's a lot of historical evidence to suggest that it was a brand new Egyptian dynasty. He wasn't even Egyptian. He came from Syria up in the north. But he, he became jealous of the fact that the, the Israelites were multiplying. And so he enslaved them. Now, traditionally, we are taught that they were enslaved for 400 years. The reason I've written 400 years question mark is because it doesn't fit with the biblical account. There are some reasons why. I won't go into them tonight for the sake of our time. But actually, they did not live in Egypt for 400 years. They lived in Egypt for about 215 years. And they were enslaved for somewhere between 80 and 144 years. So they lived in Egypt for 215 years. And they were enslaved in Egypt for somewhere between 80 and 144. We don't know why, but we know that they are the outside parameters. Simply because uh, God, when God promised to Abraham all the way back in the um, Abrahamic covenant, he says, know that your children will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. So then people go, okay, that's the Abrahamic covenant. Therefore, they were enslaved for 400 years. But the enslaving actually started when his son, Isaac, was persecuted by his brother Ishmael because Ishmael's mother was Hagar the Egyptian. So the Egyptian uh, slavery began when Ishmael, when Isaac was a boy. And the only way this works is because it is actually 430 years to the day, and there's a reference to 430 years, 430 years from the time that Abraham gets the promise until the Exodus. So that's where the 400 years comes from. It's from Abraham's day, not from the time of Jacob going into Israel into Egypt, and the only and when when you look at that, you'll actually see that that makes more sense with genealogies and the the fourth generation because it says your descendants will go in, and in the fourth generation I will bring them back. Well, the fourth generation could not possibly be four hundred years. Four generations is a lot quicker than that. And so we have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and it's actually not long after that um, that it's two generations after that they come out. So. Isaac, Jacob, and two more generations makes four generations. So we won't spend a lot of time on it, but just to, it's good to know that. Now Moses rose as a prince in Egypt. Uh, he was called and lived in Pharaoh's house by divine, uh, divine protection from the Lord. And, uh, and he was, uh, after being in Pharaoh's house and being a prince of Egypt, he had to run away because he killed an Egyptian. He spent 40 years um, as a shepherd in exile from his the nation, he wasn't. He was actually an Israelite, but had been raised as an Egyptian prince, and uh, and then he had to run away. So he spent forty years in exile. His first forty years was in the house of Pharaoh as an Egyptian prince. The next forty years was in exile, and it's at that forty after that forty years when Moses is eighty years old that he's shepherding his flock, and he sees the bush that's not being burned up, the the experience of the bush, and um, after that. God appears to him as he uh, and gives him the name. God reveals himself as Yahweh or the Tetragrammaton, meaning Tetra for Grammaton letters, four letters. Okay, that's the theological term for this. The reason we call it the Tetragrammaton is we don't actually know how to pronounce God's name. We we usually say Yahweh or Jehovah, but the reason is because over a period of time, the Israelite people became so. Uh, so obsessed with the holiness of God's name that they stopped They stopped saying it. So even in Scripture, when it's written, it's written with the four Hebrew letters that we translate as Y-H-W-H. -H. I can't remember what they are. Yah, Hod, Yah, I can't remember the Yod, Ha, I can't remember the Hebrew, the Hebrew letters. But we transliterate them to Y-H-W-H. -H. Then depending on what vowels we put in determines how we pronounce it. So in the Hebrew letter, the Hebrew alphabet, Y and J actually are the same letter. So that's why we get Jehovah. And you think about, if you've ever heard a Jew speak, especially a New York Jew, they, they say Vikend all the time. They, they pronounce W and V the same because in the Hebrew alphabet, W and V are the same letter. So depending on how you pronounce it, you can end up with Yahweh, Jehovah, Yehovah, Jahweh, whatever. We don't really know. Okay, Throughout modern history, with the exception of probably the Jehovah's Witnesses, most people have chosen to use the name Yahweh for God's name. Essentially, he reveals himself for the first time to Moses as Yahweh. I am who I am. I, I will be whatever you need me to be when you need me to be it, is what Yahweh actually means. I will be who you need me to be. So God reveals himself to the shepherd Moses on Mount Sinai. 
Moses then returns to Egypt and we have the Passover. The principle of the Passover um, is instituted uh, and it's really to show that God saves by substitution. The, the Passover lamb substi was substituted for the firstborn sons of Israel. It's a principle that is still in place. Christ is the Passover lamb and his substitution is for us. And so everything about the Passover, you have to read Christologically. You have to read it through what it's saying about Jesus Christ being our Passover lamb. So the Passover, and as a result of the Passover and the death of the firstborn in, in Egypt, the Exodus takes place. The word Exodus just simply means exit or leaving. So the Exodus means they left Egypt and out through the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea out into the wilderness. And they wandered in the wilderness for a period of 40 years. So they went around in circles. You can actually map where they went. And it's pretty much in circles for 40 years. It's about an 11-day journey from Egypt, where they were, to Canaan. And it took them 40 years to get there. They could have done it in 11 days. Because of their disobedience, they, um, they were forced to wander in the wilderness until that generation that had seen God's miracles of the Passover and the splitting of the Red Sea and all of that, until that generation, because not long after they've walked through the Red Sea, they're complaining to Moses about the fact they've got no food and they're not trusting God, and suddenly they think, we should go back to Egypt. It's a whole lot better back there, being slaves and eating onions and leeks. You're in a pretty bad place when you think onions and leeks is a good, healthy meal, but that's what they did. They got to that point where they started to think, let's go back. And so because of that, they said, oh, our children are going to die in the desert. God said, no, your children aren't going to die in the desert. Your children are going to be the ones who actually do inherit what you guys have surrendered. And so it's a sad story that they spent 40 years and of the two of all the people that came through the red sea only two of them entered the promised land joshua and caleb only two of them got to enter not even moses himself but during that time in the desert moses was given the law the mosaic law and uh, the book of exodus and deuteronomy is uh is Gen genesis exodus. so the book of exodus is uh the first giving of the law that we had the 10 commandments and sorry and leviticus the book of exodus and leviticus genesis exodus leviticus yeah that is the first giving of the law there are two parts to the law there's the commandments and the ceremonial laws the commandments are the 10 commandments ceremonial laws is all the other stuff the food the skin diseases all that stuff that you just usually get to about that point in the scripture and you just give up most, most people say I'm at the infectious skin diseases stage I'm falling asleep you know that's all those laws that take place now Actually, they're quite fascinating if you understand some of the context. We're not going to do that now, but you can actually get some context to all of that as well. And you need to understand that because then when you, if you don't understand that, you don't understand the whole lepers thing in the New Testament, which is a big thing. The reason they were outcasts because they were lepers, because of the ceremonial laws and all that sort of stuff. So those two aspects. Now, the book of Exodus has the Ten Commandments and some of the law, ceremonial laws. The book of Leviticus does it. And then Deuteronomy, the word deuter, meaning two, actually is the second giving of the law. This actually happens 40 years later. The first one happens when they came out into the wilderness. The second one, the Deuteronomy, is the re-giving of the law before they're about to enter the promised land. So 40 years later, God speaks through Moses before Moses dies and start and reminds them of what he told them 40 years ago. That's why it's mentioned twice. We just read it and think, oh, we just bogged down between Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But there's actually 40 years of dwelling in the wilderness between those two times. All right, Moses and the ceremonial laws. During that time in the desert, uh, they were given the tabernacle. They were to build the tabernacle. And the tabernacle, you were, you're, you're here referred to, the sanctuary it's called, and it's the template for Jewish worship, the template for Israelite worship. And the temple that we will see later on is just an enlarged version of this same thing. It's an enlarged version of the tabernacle. A simple little size comparison is this is an American diagram. This is an American football field and it's considerably smaller than a football field. The main articles and everything about this tabernacle, every detail points to Jesus in some way. Everything about it. Even down to the footings that these things are put in. They all point to Jesus. The blood of Christ and all sorts of things. It's a picture of Christ. But how it would work is that this was the center of Jewish worship. And uh, they would always enter from the east, and the people would come to here with their sacrifices. Only the priests were allowed inside the tabernacle. They would bring their sacrifices to there. Their sacrifices would be offered, offered on, killed on these slaughter tables, 
and burned on the altar of sacrifice, the brazen altar, brazen meaning brass. They would be built on there. So that's where all the sacrifices of sheep and goats and so on would take place on there. Beyond that, there was the brazen altar, the brazen labor, which is like sometimes called the sea. It's just a, a giant wash basin. And the purpose of that was that they would have to wash themselves before they entered into here. In this holy place here is, is actually two different rooms. And you can see it's kind of split. This place here is called the holy place. And the in behind here is called the most holy place. And there's a curtain that splits the two. The priests would come in here and perform their duties. And there's some, only three items inside here. There's the... Um, the candle, which is called the, what's it called? Shofar? No, that's the horn. Um, oh, no, no, it's what's the, the Jewish candle no, called? It's the, it's all of it. the Jew, it's on this, is right today. Right, right. Yes, it's lampstand, but it's actually got a name. I can't think of it. It's a symbol. It's actually on the Jewish. It's on, actually on the Israelite flag. It's the Israeli flag today. It's the menorah. The menorah. That's the word. Menorah. That's right there. That's really good. Oh, yeah, it helps you with the instructions, doesn't it? There we go, menorah. I thought, gee, that's mine. Yeah, well done. So it's the menorah, seven, a seven prong lampstand. On the other side, as, on the opposite side, is the table of showbread. Okay? This is a t incense altar where incense would be burned, and it was supposed to be burned constantly, all the time. There'd be incense burning. It represents the prayers of God. Incense represents the prayer. Behind there is the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant existed. Okay? And the priest would only go behind there. The high priest could only go behind there once a year. We talked about this the other week if you were in church, on the day of Yom Kippur when they do the whole scapegoat thing and all that. That is where they would go behind there. That's the place where God's throne was. God actually dwelled He's between the wings of the cherubim. It's a, there were two angelic gold cherubim over that. And that was regarded as the dwelling place of God on earth, the most holy place on earth. Okay, The Western Wailing Wall today is the closest place to where they believe the ark was. It's the closest place that Jews can get to where they believe the ark was. That's why it's regarded as the most holy place on earth to the Jewish people because it's where the ark used to be and that's as close as they're able to get because they can't get onto the Temple Mount. It's controlled by the Islam. By, by Islam. So that's why the Western Wailing Wall is so important. It represents what where the ark was. This whole picture is picture, picture the Christ. Simple thing is, let me just show you a quick, couple of quick ones. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He's referring to his representation of claiming to be the menorah. He says, I am the bread of life. All of John's Gospels, he's referring to that. The incense altar. He says, I uh, um, talks about the washing of the water of the word. It comes from there. Uh, all, all these other details in here all represent Jesus. Okay, that's the, the, uh, the tabernacle. And it was set up in the desert. And just quickly to show you. The Numbers chapter 2 tells us about the camps. It spends a whole chapter telling us about how they would all camp. And Judah, there was actually 12 tribes, and the Levites were all, they were responsible for the tabernacle. The Levites, they had the camp all around it and protected it. The camp of Judah had two other tribes with them. The camp of Dan had two other tribes with them, Reuben and Ephraim. And when you actually map it all out exactly with the numbers of people in each tribe, what do you get? A cross with the presence of God right in the middle. Jesus in the middle of the cross. And Moses would have seen this. If he came down off the mountain, that's what he would have seen. Spread out, giant prophetic. He wouldn't necessarily have known that. But what he saw on the ground, the way they were camped, was a cross. And the scripture is very particular about it. It doesn't say they camped southwest or northwest. It actually says north, east, south, and west. So they camped prophetically in the shape of a cross. It's amazing how scripture is, comes to life when we understand these things. All right, so I'm going to move on to the promised land. So after 40 years in the desert... The Israelites, uh, it was time, as I said, that uh, the descendants who'd been there um, in Egypt, who'd crossed the Red Sea into the Exodus, into the Promised Land, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, uh, they, all the others had passed away, and it was their children, their descendants, who were going to take the Promised Land. And so we're going to look in this category at the, the, the book of Joshua and the book of Judges take place in the context of the Promised Land. So... A story in Numbers, it's a fairly well-known story. It's the story of Joshua, Caleb, and the 10 other spies. Moses sent 12 spies into the land of Canaan. This happened very early on, in the uh, very early stages after the Exodus. They were sent out to spy out the land and find out about what the land was like so they could put together a battle plan to take the Promised Land. So 12 spies, one from each of the tribes, was sent out as a representative. And uh, of those 12, Joshua and Caleb came back saying, let's go, we can take the land, it's all ready for us to take it. The other 10 spies came back going, no, not a chance we can take the land. 
there are giants in the land, there are Nephilim in the land. Uh, there's, yes, there's wonderful things, but we haven't got a hope. We are small in our own eyes. And so what they did is they spread a bad report among all the people. So they started to despair and they said, oh, woe is us. We're out in the middle of the desert. We're going to die in the wilderness. And they refused to go in. So as a result of that, God said, well, you won't be able to go in. Uh, only Joshua and Caleb will be able to go in because they had a good report. They had faith to believe that God could do it. Joshua and Caleb had to still wait for the 40 years in the wilderness. So they were quite old um, at the time that they went in. So Joshua, after Moses' death, Moses died right, uh, basically right at the end of the 40 years in the wilderness at the age of 120. And it was his death that was kind of the catalyst for them to then cross into the promised land. So I'll show you the next slide and we'll go back again. So we've seen this slide already. But this is the breaking of the tribes. And so they had come out of Egypt and they had come up through the Sinai Peninsula south of the Dead Sea and basically they wandered around in this kind of area for 40 years. Um, then they stepped up and conquered, well, during that 40 years, they conquered this side. They took out some uh, some foreign countries. So Og, Og, king of Bashan, is mentioned in the Bible. You might have seen him. And it, he, he was a Nephilim as well. It, says, it talks about his bed being 12 foot long or something. Um, and it talks about him, basically, he was a, a giant of a man. So he was conquered on this side of the, the um, Jordan River on the east side. So these these tribes, Reuben, Gad, you might have heard the half-tribe of Manasseh mentioned. The reason it's the half-tribe is not a half-breed tribe, it's actually about half of the tribe. So there's half the tribe of Manasseh on this side and half the tribe of Manasseh on that side. They split, okay? So usually when you, when you see it referred to as the half-tribe of Manasseh, it's this one. You'll often hear Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh mentioned together because they were on the east side in what is modern-day Jordan. So after 40 years, Moses dies here and they prepare to cross the promised land to take, take the land of Canaan. So we'll go back to that previous slide. Joshua succeeded them. And it was a seven-year battle, a seven-year battle campaign for the promised land. And the book of Joshua basically is a seven-year story from the time the battle begins when they, take, uh, the, they cross the Jordan and take Jericho to the last battle when Joshua, in Joshua tw chapter 24, at the end of his life, he, um, well, it's a seven-year battle, but at the end of his life, the famous verse, Joshua 24, 15, when he calls everybody together, he says, choose for yourselves whom you'll serve, but as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. That takes place at the end of the, uh, Joshua's final, at the end of the seven-year battle. It's Joshua's final charge to the people. And it takes place um, between two mountains um, in what is, uh, the, later became the town of Shechem. Or, and Samaria, actually. It came to change its name to Samaria, the capital of the, of the kingdom of Israel. And uh, two mountains that they came and they had to do all this stuff in that place. So they, they uh, had to pronounce these blessings and cursings and all this sort of stuff. That all took place in the Promised Land. It was a seven-year battle. Mission not accomplished because they were commanded to completely destroy all the people, all the, the, all the ites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, the Hebites, the Girgashites, the... Benjamites and all the other rights. They were supposed to destroy all of those. It's an old joke, but it still gets a laugh. Um, I can't claim it for myself, though. They were supposed to destroy them all, but they didn't actually destroy them all. In some places, they pushed them back into the hills and they occupied the plains. In other places, they subdued them but didn't destroy them. They actually were able to kind of make them slaves, but they didn't necessarily destroy them. Now, this is where a lot of people struggle with this whole concept of why would God say completely completely destroy these people, these Amalekites and all these other rites. A lot of people question that. The simplest answer, without going into much detail now, is the message that we keep talking about all night, the Nephilim. Okay? The Nephilim were in the land during this time. God had heard, God had promised Abraham that he would take the land of Canaan. So the devil tries to distort the land of Canaan. That is why intermarriage with these people was, was forbidden and all these other things. If you, lend, if you read all those scriptures that seem like they are uh, contrary to the God of the New Testament, because it doesn't have a lot of grace in that. If you read that through the context of understanding that there are Nephilim there, there are giants there, that is why God commanded them to be destroyed because they were demonically inspired, a lot of these beings. They were distorting the bloodline. So does that make sense? Yeah. So just to understand that's the context of it. Um, and then the land was divided among the 12 tribes, as we've already looked at several times tonight in that pattern. 
And, uh, you know, I don't even remember where they made the main, where they all are. The, I remember Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh because that's mentioned all the time. The main thing to remember is is that the tribe of Judah, because that has its own, in a few moments we're going to see, that has its own uh, significance. And that was down south, um, the bottom half of the nation. You can look at the rest of them. You can pull that up and Google that at any time. That was the end of the book of Joshua. They had conquered the land. They had subdued the land. There was still um, some of the ites living in the land. For instance, the Je Jebusites are actually the ones who um, were in the, land, in the city of Jebus, which became the city of Jerusalem. So David conquered, much later, David conquered the city of the Jebusites and, um, and uh, became, uh, and he renamed it as his capital, Jerusalem, which it still is today. But they were there until much, much later on, and there were others that were still there. Okay, So it wasn't like they completely owned the land. Um, in fact, Dan, which is way up north, they live up north, the Danites. They were supposed to take this land. They didn't take it. They were so, for whatever reason, they didn't actually conquer any of that land through there. So instead of that, they just decided to pick up shop and move somewhere else. <laughs> they just didn't even go where they were supposed to go. And so the term, have you ever heard the term, term in the Bible, ever heard the term from Dan to be a Sheba? You see that come up quite often, Dan to be a Sheba. It's basically a term that means the whole breadth of the land. Be a Sheba is down here in the south, there. And Dan is right up in the north up here. So when you say Dan to be a Sheba, it's just talking about the, it'd be like going from Darwin to Hobart. That would be the context of Dan to be a Sheba. It means the, all the land because they didn't even take the land they were supposed to allocate them. So after Joshua, uh, so after Joshua, the book of Joshua, we enter into the judges period of time. 330 tumultuous years in the book of Judges, over 330 years, it's a very, very depressing book. It's this kind of book that's got a lot of bloodshed in it. Joshua does too, you know. It's sort of thing you probably don't want, like, Ollie reading the book of Joshua until he's a bit older. But, and there's a lot of bloodshed, a lot of wars. And Judges is a, is a pitiful state of affairs. They're taking the land. And in the course of the book of Judges, over these 330 years, there's seven recurring cycles of this. Rebellion, enslavement, repentance, deliverance. It says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. It comes up several times. They rebelled, and as a result of rebelling against God, they were enslaved by a neighboring country. Sometimes it was the Moabites, the Amalekites, all the neighboring ites all around, enslaved them. And then they, once they were enslaved for a period of time, they cried out to God. God sent them a deliverer, a judge, who delivered them. Things went well for a while. When that judge died, they rebelled again. And the cycle happened seven times in 330 years. And this particular refrain here happens, uh, what, one, two, three, four times in the book of Judges. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's a picture of the way our world is heading today. That's why I mention it. Because we are being told, you know, it, there is no such thing as an absolute, moral absolutes anymore. You Hearing it at school, our kids are being educated. Everyone can do whatever they want to do. The whole concept of you can't have, live by a moral law. Everybody can do whatever they want to do. You can't tell me how to live my life. You can't tell me what, what is appropriate for me and my family. Right? The problem with that is that it's absence of moral obsolete, obsolete, uh, absolutes actually becomes this problem, mm -hmm. anarchy. When everyone does what they see fit, when no one lives to an absolute law, we will end up that way if we don't change. We'll end up with moral decay, which will lead to enslavement. Whether it's enslavement by a foreign nation is yet to be seen. But that's a picture of what's happening in the Western world today. It happened seven times in 330 years in the book of Judges. Quickly on to the book of Ruth. This is a fascinating little book. Four short chapters. You can sit down and read it in half an hour. It happens during the Judges period. It takes place towards the end of the Judges period. And um, it actually is important because it links the patriarchal period, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with the kingly period, the kingdom period, which we're going to do next. It's a link between those two. And it spans the book of Judges, those 330 years. It's a picture, a prophetic picture of Christ. The whole story is a picture of Jesus. Boaz is the redeemer who redeems his Gentile bride. Ruth is a Gentile bride. It's a picture of what Jesus did. He's the redeemer. He's referred to as one of his names. He's the redeemer. I know that my redeemer lives. It's a name for God. And it's a picture of how Boaz, through what this principle is called the law. It was a mosaic law called the, the law of Leverite marriage that said that if uh, someone died, then another person was required, a next of kin, and it was required to 
um, obtain that land and keep it. We haven't got time to go into the whole process now. But it all points to Jesus. And it's a fa fascinating story in that way about redemption, about Christ. It's tying the whole thing together, linking us between what we've just read in the book of Genesis with what we're about to read in all the books of the kingdoms. It's an important little book to go on to. Then, the United Kingdom is the next chapter in our story. No, not the United Kingdom of England, the United Kingdom of Israel. Okay, We're going to look at Saul, David, and Solomon, the three kings that reigned over what we call the United Kingdom. Samuel, uh, the book of First and Second Samuel, actually were not written by Samuel. Samuel might have written some of the book of First Samuel, but Samuel's dead about halfway through the book of First Samuel, so he can't have written the whole thing, or three quarters of the way through it. It's referred to um, it's historically just given that name, but it wasn't probably written by him. So Samuel was the last of the judges. So we have uh, notable judges, uh, Samson, um, uh, Gideon, Ehud's the one that I like because he's this little left-handed guy who goes and pulls out a stab and shoves it, yeah, a little bloke's like, shoves it into the king's belly and leaves the dagger inside the king's belly and walks away and leaves it in there and escapes down through the toilet. That's just a pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit smelly at the end of it, but that's how he got out. But the main one's Samson, Deborah. There you go, for the ladies. Deborah is a well-known judge. Samuel is actually the last judge, even though we don't think of him that way. He technically was the last judge. He was leading Israel as a judge. And it was during that time that um, the people cried out and said, we want, a bit, we want a king. We want to have a king like all the other nations around us. And so Samuel cried out to God and said, what am I supposed to do with these people? You called me to lead them. I'm, he's not their king, he's their judge. God says, give them a king. If that's what they want, they can have one. But they're going to find out the king they have is not the one that I necessarily had. Important to realize, God did have a king ready for him. He had prophesied there would be a king. Some people think, oh, no, the king was a second thought. No, the king wasn't a second thought. God always intended to give a king. It's just that he was what well, the king that he wanted wasn't quite ready yet. But because they were crying out for a king, he said, well, let's go find one. They gave him Saul, King Saul. Saul was notable because he was taller than everybody else. He was stronger than everybody else. He was a handsome man. He had all that outward stuff going for him. And he was chosen to be the first king. And he started well, but he didn't finish well. He basically became uh, over. He went from being very, very insecure and, and supposedly humble, but insecure, became power hungry and became insecure in a different way. He never got over his insecurity issues. You see, insecurity affects us two different ways. We either shrink back when we're insecure and go, oh, you know, I don't want, I don't want to get in that circle. I don't want to be involved in those people because I'm not good enough. Or insecurity goes, when we are in that circle, we go the other way and we become um, controlling when we're insecure. That's what happened to him. So he became very jealous of David later on. Um, insecurity and disobedience actually cost him the kingdom. And uh, it, 1 Samuel 16, chapter 16, after Saul is king is where David first comes onto the scene. And so Dave, we read about David in 1 Samuel uh, 16 through to the, all of 2 Samuel and also in 1 Chronicles chapter 10 verse through to, uh, through to 1 Chronicles chapter 9, all about David. David is uh, referred to as a man after God's own heart, significant uh, character in the, um, the life of the scriptures. Jesus is referred to as the son of David, one of the key characters. If I had to say who are the main characters in the Old Testament that you really need to know about, I would say Abraham, Joseph, David, Moses, four. They would probably be the top four that would help you to understand the New Testament. Abraham, David, Joseph, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, David, in that order historically. So David was the Lord's choice. He was the one who God had always appointed and, protect, and, and appointed to be the king. So when the time came, he became the king. And it was David who actually defeated and subdued all the neighboring nations. He, he, over, he was the one who finally defeated the Philistines. When uh, Later on in his kingdom, he defeated the Moabites and all the neighboring nations. Uh, he also... He had a massive kingdom that he ruled over. He is also reg regarded as the psalmist. He wrote most of the psalms, not, not all of them, but he wrote a good number of them. We'll come back to that in a moment. He conquered the city of Jebus, who I mentioned before, and that renamed it as Jerusalem. That became his city. And the story of Bathsheba, of course, is a significant story. In fact, the Bible says David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the days of his life, except that situation. That was his one major hiccup. He had a few other minor hiccups, but that was his one major hiccup, where he um, where he sinned 
had Bathsheba. And it's an incredible story because it's a story of sin, consequence, and redemption. He should have been at war, and he wasn't. It says, in the spring when kings go off to war, David stayed at home. That was his first mistake. He wasn't where he should have been. So in the process of not being where he should have been, he saw Bathsheba, and he slept with her. And then to get himself out of it, he called her husband back from the battlefield and tried to get his husband, her husband to sleep with him so they, they would think that the child was him. But this man... Was, had great integrity. He wouldn't do that. He said, oh, I'm not going to go and sleep with my wife and do all that while kings battle and the ark and everybody's out on the battlefield. So in the end, David went from one sin, adultery, to another sin, making Uriah drunk, another sin, ultimately murdering Uriah. He sent Uriah back to the battle line with his own death warrant, a sign and sealed, who wouldn't even open it. <coughs> and he was killed on the battlefield. David, uh, David basically murdered him. It's hard to fathom a man after God's own heart, but it's liberating to us because it shows that God is a redeemer and God is a forgiver and there is redemption in the story. There is also consequence. That child died and the, the end result, the, the, the incredible consequence that flows out of this story that you need to understand is that the whole rest of what we're about to read about, the divided kingdom, comes as a result of this sin. The mess in David's household from that moment on comes as a result of this sin. The reason that that's important for us is that a lot of people teach soppy grace. That when we sin and we repent, God forgives and therefore God takes away the problem. That's not what the scriptures teach. God takes away the sentence of death over our life. If we sin that means, and we repent, God will forgive us. We don't go to hell for our sin. But we still have to live with the consequences of our sin. So a person who's been an alcoholic all their life, and repents and gives their life to Christ may still have to live with the consequences of liver disease, for instance. Okay, it doesn't mean that those consequences automatically are done away with. If a person commits any kind of sin, if a person goes to jail, or commits a crime, and goes to and, and it's it, they may have to go to jail for committing that crime, even though they've repented, because they have to live out the consequences of that sin. And to think that we shouldn't live out the consequences is actually poor doctrine. David still had to live with the consequences. And do you remember his, I think, I'm not sure if we'll do it, his son Absalom, who succeeded, tried to take the throne off him. Um, he, the reason David was so upset that Absalom died, it says David, David wept and wept and wept at his, over Absalom, his son, the very son who tried to kill him. The reason he wept over him so much was because he knew that the whole mess came from him. He knew he was the cause of the whole problem in the first place because when uh, the prophet came to Nathan, the prophet Nathan came to David and told him about this whole story and said, you're the one who's committed sin. David repented of his sin. But part of that was the Lord, Nathan, the prophet says to him, the Lord has taken away your sin, but because you have done this and made the enemies of the Lord show contempt, I will bring calamity upon you from your own household and you will live out the consequences and your family will live out the consequences of your sin. So sin does not just affect us, it affects our descendants. Mm -hmm. We have to keep that in mind. Yeah. None of us is an island. It will affect our children and potentially even our children's children. We have to remember the consequence of our sin. Because I think a lot of Christians think, well, I can sin now, repent later. I would say, yes, you can sin now and repent later, but don't assume that you'll get out without the consequences of your sin. You may be forgiven, but you'll, those around you may still have to live out, and you yourself may have to live out the consequences of that sin. All right, over to the Psalms. Just a quick mention about the Psalms. The Psalms are a collection of songs and prayers from throughout Israel's history. About half were written by David and some other ex uh, significant contributors are the sons of Korah. They were a tribe of, they were a, a family, a clan of Levites who were priests and they wrote a lot of the songs themselves. There's about, um, there's about 20 there. Six to, uh, Asaph and the sons of Korah wrote about 20 each or something like that. David wrote about half, about 70 something. 16 of the Psalms are what we call Messianic Psalms. They're specifically prophetic about Jesus in great depth. So Psalms like, um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That Jesus, the Jesus quoted on the cross. Um, Psalm 22, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. I think that's Psalm 22. 16 Messianic Psalms. Um, the Psalms between Psalm 120 and 134 are called the Song of Ascents, the Songs of Ascent. And these particular Psalms were sung by the people as they were making their way up to Jerusalem for the feasts. And so these are Psalms where you see 
I was glad when they said, let us go up to the house of the Lord and so on. You'll see, if you read those Psalms, you see that they're actually, they fit with the context of making their way up to Jerusalem because they headed up from the lowlands up into the hills to Jerusalem. Hence we call them the songs of ascent. And then about halfway through these Psalms, they see the, the, the temple and it's all its array on the side of the hill. And so that's what those Psalms, part of the worship and it would kind of be like all the families get together and sing those Psalms as they made their way up for the feast. Okay, so that's a bit about the Psalms. And we'll move on to Solomon, David's son. So Solomon, does anyone know who Solomon, Solomon's mother was? Mm. The one who, yeah. Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Yep, that's her. So that's where redemption comes in. The first son died, all this calamity, but God actually used David's biggest mistake to be turned it around, redeemed it, and used it to bring about the heir, the promised son. Important for us to know that because God is so... Redeeming means to buy back. He takes our biggest mistakes and will make them part of our journey and will use them for his glory. Solomon comes from the son that probably should never have been born and becomes the ordained purpose of God. Shows me how wonderful God is. Solomon, he expanded... Well, actually, he didn't expand David's kingdom, but he enforced David's kingdom. Solomon, Solomon's reign was the highest point of Israel's history. It was when it had the most influence, the most peace, its most wealthy in all of history was under the reign of King Solomon. He built the temple in Jerusalem. David bankrolled it. Solomon built it. It was the centerpiece, centerpiece of Jewish worship from that day to this. So where the temple was built is still what we call the Temple Mount today. Okay, and We'll see it was expanded, but it's on that same site. That's where where it has been, as I say, that the Western Wall is the, is actually a, a well, the Wailing Wall is another name for it. It's actually um, the it's basically the foundations, the retaining wall of what is now the Temple Mount, and that's the closest point. But it was built. There are stones there that are built that are from, from this day. Okay, so it's still there to this day. Solomon was also a prolific writer of three thousand proverbs. It tells us in a thousand and five songs. I don't know why it says a thousand and five, but it does. So he was a prolific writer, incredibly wise, and yet also incredibly foolish. Okay, he was made very wise, but he also simply disobeyed a few things. We're not going to look at scriptures because we don't have time. First Kings chapter 10, 10 here, when it's compared with Deuteronomy chapter 17, realize, makes you realize that Solomon did something really foolish. When In Deuteronomy, when they were still in the wilderness, it says, when you go into your promised land and you have a, you have a king, make sure that the king does not marry foreign women, because they will turn their heart away and do not um, add to themselves chariots and horses. This scripture here tells us Solomon loved many foreign women and he had 3,000 horses and da da da, da chariots and da da da. The two things that he was not supposed to do, he did. The other thing that this scripture tells us is that the king was supposed to handwrite the law. When they became a king, it was their responsibility to handwrite out the entire law, keep it by them every day and read it. Because they were supposed to be under kings. They were not supposed to be the king of kings. They were supposed to be the king under the king, Jehovah. And so they were, that was an expectation upon the king. Solomon clearly didn't do those things. Despite his wisdom, he was led astray. And ultimately, as a result of that, he lost the kingdom. The kingdom was torn away from him. Okay, And that's where we get to what is called the divided kingdom. So Solomon ruled over all of the land of Israel. And then we have the divided kingdom because of Solomon's disobedience. So what happens is Solomon disobeys. A prophet comes to him and says, because you have disobeyed, the Lord is going to take the kingdom away from you. But nevertheless, because of his faithfulness and promise to your father, David, he will give you one tribe. So David was promised that he would have a descendant on him. Important to know that. So when Solomon dies, there's a rebellion against Solomon's son. His son's name is Rehoboam. And Rehoboam is appointed as king over the whole nation of Israel. But because of this rebellion, there's another man by the name of Jeroboam who rebels against Rehoboam. I don't expect you to remember those names, but Jeroboam rebels against Rehoboam and takes and splits the kingdom. And we have what we call the divided kingdom. So once again, you can see here's a sketch map. So Judah, remember I said to you Judah was down south? That's because Judah maintained the, 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 the kingdom of Judah stayed with David's descendants. 
the northern kingdom. So sometimes you'll, refer, you'll hear it referred to as the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. All around. Northern kingdom, southern kingdom. The northern kingdom kept the name of Israel. That's just to confuse you. So you need to know whether we're talking United Kingdom or Divided Kingdom. Because in the United Kingdom, under, under uh, where we, David, Saul, David and Solomon, the whole thing is called Israel. After Solomon's death, the Divided Kingdom, the Northern Kingdom is called Israel and the Southern Kingdom is called Judah. Okay, So you just need to know some historical context or you'll get confused about what you're reading there. Okay, The Northern Kingdom, um, basically its main capital became Samaria, from which the Samaritans come later. And Israel, sorry, Judah's kingdom remained as uh, its its kingdom became Judah. So, oh, the migration north and south. So, have you, has anyone ever heard this? In fact, the guys out at the common ground believe in this. The, the whole lost tribe of the lost tribe thing. Have anyone heard about that? The lost tribe of Dan and all this sort of stuff. It's one problem with all of those beliefs about where's this missing tribe. The problem is that the scriptures. They read the scriptures. They would realize that there are no missing tribes. Because it actually says, when this took place, it actually said, those who were living in the south who didn't want to follow God migrated north. And it says, those who were living north who wanted to follow God migrated south. So all the tribes actually still existed in the southern kingdom. There was no lost tribe. There might have been some people who were lost, but all 12 tribes were still represented in the southern kingdom. Okay, So that's important to recognize in order for it to make context. So there was this migration north and south. So the northern kingdom, the nation of Israel, lasted for 200 years, and there were 10 dynasties. So a dynasty is like a family. Okay, It's not like, not like the television show dynasty. I suppose that's probably what it means. A dynasty is a family that rules. So there were 10 different families ruling in the northern kingdom during that time. There are one or two that I would say half-decent kings in that lot. One or two half-decent kings by, in terms of their faithfulness to God in the northern kingdom. The rest were rebellious and worshipped pagan gods. They were ultimately attacked and assimilated by the Assyrians in 722 BC. Let me just go back and show you this. Jeroboam, when he rebelled from Rehoboam, he, what he did was he, he didn't want people. He, after he rebelled and they all sided with him, he said, oh, these guys are still going to go and worship in the temple. And when they go to the temple to worship, they'll give their heart back to, to Judah, to Rehoboam. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to, set up new gods for them to worship. So he created two golden calves, which it was a direct parallel to the whole golden calf thing in the, we didn't talk about it tonight, but the whole golden calf thing in the desert when Aaron created the golden calf. He created one. He put one up here in Dan and one in Bethel, which is right there near the border. Basically said, these are the gods who led you out of Egypt. Go and worship them. It was basically, it was a political thing. Nothing more than a political thing. He didn't care about whether they were worshipping or anything. He just wanted to make sure they wouldn't head south and end up worshipping and end up realigning with Judah. So he set up two gods, and it's called the sins of Jeroboam. The sin, and you see it referred to over and over again in the book of Kings, the sin of Jeroboam. It was this golden calf thing that he set up. Okay, so that was the what happened in the northern kingdom. They were eventually, um, eventually attacked and assimilated by the Assyrians in 722 BC, about 200 years after they, they were divided. It's important to recognize they were assimilated, because we'll come back to that. There are there are two kinds of attacks on kingdoms. Assimilation was one form of ethnic cleansing. So what would happen is that they would take them, they would basically intermarry. It's very much the philosophy of what the whole stolen generation is about in Australia. Assimilation is the process of if you intermarry enough, you will water down the gene pool and remove the Aboriginal culture. That's what, that's what the theory was, completely distorted and wrong. But that's what they believe. So they would assimilate through intermarriage. The other way is to actually take people and move them out of the land, okay? Which is what happened to Judah. But Israel was assimilated. They just they took some, moved them in elsewhere, and they brought some people in from other nations into the land, and they intermarried. Those intermarried people in the northern kingdom, when they were in, when they intermarried, they became by the time of Christ they were referred to as anyone know Samaritans, okay? That's why the Jews didn't like the Samaritans. They regarded them as half-breeds, okay, because they were inbred, if you like, but they weren't pure Israelites. The southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, despite the fact that the northern kingdom went through all those uh, ten dynasties or whatever it was, the southern kingdom had one unbroken dynasty all the way through the family of David. 
It wasn't always perfect, but, but it did maintain one dynasty, which was God's promise that he would always have a descendant on the throne of David. Several godly kings and several wicked kings. It was a pretty, pretty interesting mix there. Um, they were eventually attacked and defeated by the Babylonians in 586. They lasted about 100 extra 130 something years, longer than the, than the Northern Kingdom. So after the Northern Kingdom's gone, there's another 136 years of the Southern Kingdom's existence before they were um, defeated by the Babylonians due to their own rebellion and sinfulness as well. Just a quick touch on where the prophets fall in. When you read the prophetic books, we're not going to look at them all, but there's key ones here. Elijah and Elisha are key ones. They prophesied to the northern kingdom, the nation of Israel. You read about Elijah and Elisha. They don't have their own prof books called Pro uh, Elijah and Elisha, but you read about those in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. Essentially, 1 Kings is, is really about Elijah, and 2 Kings is about Elisha. Two significant prophets to the northern kingdom. And this just some dates for reference of when these other guys, Jonah, Joel, Amos, and Hosea, when they were in existence. You can see that, you know, we read it over a period of time, but they, they don't have a reasonable difference between 725 there and 870, 150 years of difference. Prophets to Judah, Isaiah is the most notable of those, um, and Jeremiah at the end, and those minor other guys in between. Interestingly, when it says minor prophets, we have the major prophets and the minor prophets. It doesn't mean they're unimportant. It doesn't mean minor like that, okay? Don't think, oh, people go, oh, they're not really important. No, they're very important. It's just they're minor prophets because they're, they're shorter books generally. It's minor in terms of the length of what's written about them. Jer so Isaiah prophesied uh, while the kingdom was still in existence. It, 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 he was around about the time of the end of the northern kingdom. Um, and then Jeremiah prophesied around the time of the exile, which is the next thing we're going to look at, the exile. So after, in 586, after the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom, they were carried off into exile. They were taken to Babylon. And uh, the northern kingdom was assimilated in 722, despite their prophetic warnings to repent, they didn't repent. And as I said here, there's a lot of stuff. Ethnic cleansing took place, the creation of the Samaritans. And so they had a pseudo-worship of Yahweh. They, they didn't fully understand it. They had a pseudo-worship. So when Jesus goes to the woman at the well and talks to her in John chapter 4, she's got some understanding of how to worship. She says, you Jews are supposed to worship in Jerusalem. We worship on this mountain. But they still worship Yahweh, but it was just distorted. So that's where they came from, uh, the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom were defeated by Nebuchadnezzar. The walls of Jerusalem were demolished. The temple was demolished and everything valuable was taken away to Babylon. So the entire Solomon's temple was destroyed um, completely, carried off to Babylon. All the temple utensils, everything of value was carried away. The people were deported to Babylon. Interestingly, that Tower of Babylon is in modern day Iraq. It's all, all pretty much all the way back where Abraham started his journey from in the first place. About set a thousand miles as the as the Fertile Crescent goes, it's a long, long way. 700 miles, I think, 1,000 kilometers or something. A long way away. But the Jews, the people who were deported, they refused to intermarry. They were, they were a pain in the backside of the Babylonians because they stuck to themselves. They refused to intermarry. They, they upheld their integrity during the time of the exile. They made a home for themselves in, the far, in, in this foreign land. Some of Judah's finest formed a new Jewish community. So they were exiled to there, and they actually created a Jewish community, which still exists. There are still very strong Jewish strongholds in modern-day Iraq and Iran. And it comes from the fact that even after the exile took place, some didn't go back. Some stayed in that, area, in that part of the world, and they're still there today. Daniel was a very rich young man. He came from aristocracy, it would appear, and uh, Ezekiel was the same. And here we go, two and a half thousand years later, they still live on in that part of the world. The Babylonians were defeated in time by the Medes and the Persians. The reason there was a 70-year period of exile was because that directly res related to the number of years that the Jews had not done what they were supposed to do. Because they were required in the law every seven years to rest the land. Trust God that he would provide a harvest for them. Let the land rejuvenate its nutrients every seven years. The whole time they were in Israel, which happened to be 490 years, they didn't do that. And because they didn't do that, there was, should have been, in 490 years, there should have been 70 years of Sabbath rest. So there wasn't. 
So God says, okay, I'm going to send you into exile for 70 years. And it actually says, during that time, the land will enjoy its Sabbath rests. So the, the land was not car- harvested during that time. It was allowed to lay fallow because they had not done what they were told to do in the beginning. 70 years. That's why there were 70 years. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27 is what we call Daniel's 70-week prophecy. I'm not going to go into it now, but it's good to know that that prophecy predicts from the, it gives very strict date predictions. And it predicts from the date that a certain thing happens until the date that Jesus rides in to Jerusalem as presents himself as Messiah on a donkey. It predicts that exactly to the day, from the day it happened to that day. So that is part of why they knew roughly why, when the Messiah was coming. Remember when they go to Herod and they know roughly where the Messiah is to be born and when he's to be born? They knew that it was about right because of this prophecy. But it predicted it to the day that it would take place. From the decree of Cyrus. Cyrus was a Persian who took over the kingdom. And he was a man who was allowed to, he commanded the Jews to go back and rebuild. He gave them permission to go back into their land and rebuild the city. And he was prophesied by Isaiah 400, 200, 200 years before that his name is mentioned. Isaiah says, he prophesies about a man called Cyrus and says, he will be my servant and he will rebuild the city. So when Cyrus becomes comes into Babylon, conquers Babylon, Daniel actually opens up a book, shows him the prophet Isaiah and says, hey, your name's already written here 200 years ago. You're supposed to send everyone back. So he goes, wow, God's really God in heaven. So he actually sends everyone back as a direct result of seeing his name prophesied in a book from 200 years before. That's where it comes from. Prophets to the exiles, Daniel, Obadiah and Ezekiel. If you really want to get freaked out, just read the book of Ezekiel. It's seriously the weirdest book in the whole Bible. If you ever think God doesn't do things weird, just read that book. It's got some really weird stuff in it. Doing okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can. 9.20. I'm watching time, but yeah, but we kind of, we, we started 15 minutes late. We had a 15 minute break, wasn't we? But I'll see how we go. The return. So after 70 years in exile, they return. And the story of Ezra, Nehemiah, and the new temple take place during this time. So it was while they were in exile, the tribe of Judah became known as the Jews during that time in exile. So they left as the tribe of Judah, they returned as the Jews. That's where it comes from. Okay, you want to know where, why was it Israel, why was it Judah, why was it the Jews? Simple as that. It's actually, I think it's a different language version of the word Judah. And they, from then on, by the time of Christ, they're called Jews. They're still called Jews today. That's why. Um, the book of Ezra is about rebuilding the temple. They were sent back to rebuild the temple now. As they rebuilt, established what Solomon had dropped. Um, they re-established Jewish worship. The book of Nehemiah follows on, and that's about rebuilding the walls of the city. So the temple is built, but they haven't got walls. Nehemiah is about rebuilding the walls. The book of Esther is an important book. That takes place during that exile period. And uh, it is um, an interesting book for two reasons. One, it's the only book in the Bible that doesn't mention God at all. Not once will you find a reference to God in there. And yet God is all over the book. Because it's a book about redemption. Why is it important? Because the devil was trying to destroy the seed of the woman. His whole purpose was to get Haman to obliterate the Jews. And Esther is the redeemer. That's why Mordecai says, who knows but that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Her, the whole book is there to show that the devil tried to obliterate the Jews. Esther, a woman, saved the day. That's what the book's about. It's also an incredible love story for you ladies as well. <laughs> One Night with the King, the movie. They made it. Did you see the One Night with the King movie? Did you see that, Kim? You see that? Read the book. It's historical fiction. There you go. Made into a movie. Yeah, beautiful historical fiction. One night with the king. Prophets to the returning exile. So after they come back, Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi return to them. Haggai is prophesying to them because they started the building and stopped. They got lazy halfway through and Haggai goes, no, don't stop yet. Keep building. So he was encouraging them to do that. Zechariah is a prophetic one. Lots of end time prophecy in the book of Zechariah. A lot of links between Zechariah and the book of Revelation. A lot of weird stuff in Zechariah. Um, Links with the book of Revelation. Malachi, the final prophet, somewhere between 440 and 400 BC. We don't know exactly when. And uh, he prophesies about the coming Messiah. In those days, the Messiah will come. Then we head into what is called the silent years. 
That's one of the terms the theologians give it, the silent years, but it's really not silent at all. It's called the silent years because there's no prophet, no prophets during that time. For 400 years from the time of Malachi until the time of John the Baptist, there's no prophet, no prophetic voice. But it's not silent geographically and his, or historically it's not silent. There's an awful lot happening. All these empires take place during that time. <coughs> Daniel, when King Nebuchadnezzar was king in Babylon, he was given a vision that Daniel interpreted. A vision of Nebuchadnezzar's statue. A golden head, um, silver chest, bronze waist, iron legs, and uh, iron and clay, um, and toes, and then this big rock that comes and destroys the whole thing. Daniel interprets it, and he says... Way back at the beginning, he says, you, O King Nebuchadnezzar, are the Babylonian Empire. You're the golden head. After your kingdom, he's prophesying all this. After your kingdom will come another one, the silver. Then there'll come another one, the Greek. Then there'll come another one, iron. And those ones, we now know, are the silver is the Medes and the Persians. That was the Greek Empire. Then the Roman Empire. And then there's one at the end that hasn't happened yet. The toes, the iron and clay. It's a mixture of iron and clay. It's actually a prophecy about the end time kingdom, the Antichrist's kingdom that's yet to come. And it shows us that it's linked with the Roman Empire in some way, but it's also got ten toes, which links across to the book of Revelation with ten heads for the the, the dragon in the book of Revelation and all that. And then in the end, this big rock comes, destroys the whole thing and grows up and fills the world. That rock is Christ's kingdom. Okay, so it's a prophetic... Daniel gets a prophecy... Sorry, Nebuchadnezzar gets a vision, and Daniel prophesies about basically from that point on until the end of time. That's why that prophecy is important. It fits uh, with this whole context. So during the time of the, um, the the silent years, this is what happens. Well, prior to prior to the exile, the Assyrians conquer Israel. The Babylonians at the exile conquer Judah, and then after they come back. The Medes and Persians are in control. They send them back. Then the Greeks take over. That's Alexander the Great, famous young man who basically conquered the whole world and then got depressed because he had nothing else to conquer at the age of 20-something and died. Literally, that's what happened. He just basically got depressed because he couldn't conquer anything else. Um, he conquered, and then he, his kingdom was split between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. And then there was a period of independence. We don't read about this in the Bible, but you may it's in what they call the, the Old Testament Apocrypha. Judas Maccabeus, he was a Jew that there was about a hundred years of independence where they fought off the Greeks and Israel in Ju- with Judah, the Jews had a period of independence. Then the Romans came along and, uh, and took over and by the time of Jesus, the Roman Empire is ruling. Why is that all important? Because despite the fact there's no prophetic voice, God is very busy in the world. He's actually preparing the world to receive the gospel. This is why it's important. During the Greek Empire... Greek became the common language. Before that, there was no common language throughout the Europe and the Middle East. Greek came along. Alexander, the Greek Empire, instituted the language. And even when the Romans came along, does anyone know what the Romans common the Romans language is? What what Latin. Latin? Okay, but Latin didn't become the common language. They just kept Greek. So New Testament was written in Greek. Greek was the common language of the world at that time. They didn't have that. So that had to happen. If the gospel was going to be spread beyond Israel, there had to be a common language. That's what happened during that time. The, during that time, there were Jews living in other parts of Europe. They translated the Old Testament into Greek. Before that, it was only in Hebrew. It was translated into Greek, and it's called the Septuagint, meaning 70. There were 70, 70 scholars that translated it. That's the Bible that Jesus would have used, the Septuagint. He spoke Greek. Um, Hebrew was a dead language by that time. They actually didn't speak Hebrew. They spoke Aramaic. So their native language in Israel was Aramaic. Um, And we only see Jesus speaking Aramaic a handful of times. The most notable is when he's on the cross. And he says, Eloi, Eloi, salama sabachthani, which is Latin, which which is Aramaic for my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's about two or three other times when it actually mentions Jesus speaks in our English version, it says, he says, if Fafa, be open. Or he says, little girl, Talitha Kulam, get up, Peter says. Little, they mention it, but then they translate and tell you what it means because the other than the, the Jews, no one would have known what it meant because it was their native language. So they needed Greek. The Pax Romana was means the peace of Rome. Under the Roman Empire, contrary to what Asterix comics and all the books show you, it was an incredible time of peace. The Pax Romana brought about peace. They basically destroyed piracy in the Mediterranean. They pretty much stopped it with their massive galleys and all their slaves. They could basically run down any ship. So what all these other problems that had existed for hundreds of years 
were gone away. It was an incredibly peaceful time. They um, built Roman roads. The saying, all roads lead to Rome, literally, that's where it comes from. Throughout the entire Roman Empire, they used slaves to build roads. So no longer were they back alleys. There were actually main roads that they could put horse and cars on. You could literally go from Palestine or Israel, you get on a road with a horse and cart and go all the way to Rome, throughout Turkey, through Greece and over to Rome. So it became very easy to travel, became reasonably safe because all these Roman roads were constantly, Roman roads were constantly patrolled by Roman legions. So it was incredibly safe as long as you weren't doing anything stupid. You were actually well protected. And there was also a declining sense of national identity and religious practices because people were being displaced, other people were coming in. And so all of these things led to getting the world ready to receive the gospel. So it was silent in prophetic voice, but God, it's like God said, I'm going to silence the prophetic voice and I'm going to get to work in the rest of the world. Make it all ready for the gospel. So when by the time Jesus comes along, the Roman Empire is ready to receive the gospel. And what we're going to do for the sake of time when we get to it is we're going to kind of skip over to Jesus period of time. Don't tell Jesus I said that. You know, <laughs> but I think you guys know that. You can read it in your notes. And I might recall that later if I need to. But I just want to not take too long. At the end of the, just prior to the time of Jesus, the Romans instituted the Herodian dynasty. Herod the Great um, was appointed by Rome to rule over uh, Judah, or what was then called Judea, the nation of Judea. The, the land of Judea, the Roman pro, the Roman area of Israel was called Judea. And Herod was was not a Jew. He was actually an Idumean, which is from which means Edomite. He was actually one of Esau, Esau's descendants, Jacob's brother. Uh, he was not particularly liked by the Jews because he claimed to be the king of the Jews, but he wasn't even a Jew. He um, did a lot of important work. So he started in 37 BC. He is the one who uh, killed the firstborn in Bethlehem. He, um, but what he did was of note is he expanded the temple. So he took the temple that had been rebuilt after the exile. And he went, it's not big enough. So he did it as a favor to the Jews. He expanded it to make it a lot bigger, which is what it is today. The, the temple mount today, the big bit you see with the dome of the rock on it and everything, that is still what the temple sat on. Okay, he did that. He also did other massive building projects. Caesarea Maritima became the capital of Israel, a big, massive... Um, uh, massive uh, city on the coastline of Israel, which actually, as of tomorrow night, Hillsong are doing their next Israel tour concert in that. If you watch it, you'll see they're doing it in the ancient, in, in this particular arena that Herod built. It's still there today. It's still used for concerts. They're going to so they're going to be having a concert in a two thousand two thousand year old place. That's going to be so cool. So that's where they're actually going to be. It's going to seat fifteen hundred people or something. Actually, just, I think it seats 10,000 people or something. So that's uh, going to be taking place there tomorrow night. They also He also built his own palace called the Herodium. He basically looked for the best place he could find, the highest place he could find. He couldn't find a place high enough, but he did see two hills next to each other. So what he got all his slaves to do is completely cut one hill down and carry all the dirt and put it on top of the other hill. So you can actually see it today. He took this mountain and moved it over here and made it bigger. Does that sound like something Jesus says? <laughs> with when you say to this mountain, you can be moved from here to there, it will obey you. Jesus was referring to Herod's building project. That's where it came from. So he died. He was neurotic. He slaughtered his he slaughtered the innocents. He actually killed his own family, killed his own wives. He was messed up, dude, this guy. He died, and his kingdom was split in, uh, in different ways. Herod Antipas was the king who his his son who took over Judea and it was Herod Antipas that was that uh, was alive at the time of Christ's uh, death and was instant when you read about Herod putting Jesus to death with Pontius Pilate this is the Herod that did that he died a few years later and he was preceded by Herod Agrippa and Herod Agrippa was I think his nephew and that's the Herod or the King Herod the Her King Gri Agrippa that you read about that the Apostle Paul was dealing with when he was in place. This is um, a map of what Herod's, this is actually not a map, this is actually a, a model, scale model of what Herod's temple looked like on the Temple Mount. Very ornate. But you can still see the same pattern as the, as the sanctuary. The outer court, where the sacrifices would take place, through the east gate, the outer court, this is the holy of the holy place and the holy of holies. follows the same pattern as it was all the way back in the desert. Okay, what we'll do is we'll 
skip over the stuff about Jesus because we just don't have time. But basically, Jesus ministered for three and a half years. Um, and completely, within 300 years, his message had brought Rome to its knees. And we'll go over the timeline of Jesus, and you can just pretty much read that. Get on to the church age. We're nearly there. The church age is the period of time following the resurrection of Christ until... Um, basically until the modern day. We are in what is called the church age today, the age of the church. The church didn't exist prior to that um, and prior to the resurrection of Christ. So three main times to look at, the apostles, the dark ages, and the reformation we didn't look at. So the apostles is the book of Acts. It's the stuff we read about in the Bible that takes place after Jesus' resurrection, the book of Acts. We see Peter, the apostle Peter, who oversees the, uh, the preaching to the Jews. Uh, how far are we skipping ahead? I don't know what page one. Do you know? 16. 16. Okay, page 16. The Peter um, uh, preaches to the Jews. Um, he actually also preached to the Gentiles. He preached the first sermon to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, but his primary responsibility was to the Jews. Paul was the apostle primarily to the Gentiles, and he took the gospel to Asia and Greece. Um, mainly, Asia is modern-day Turkey. Greece is still... Modern day Greece. Rome persecuted Christianity. So, in the early stages, they tolerated Christianity because they just thought of it as a Jewish sect. But not long after that, it became obvious it was no longer a Jewish sect that had influence of its own. And so, they, they were highly persecuted. So, Christians were tortured, burned at the stake, thrown to the lions, thrown into the arena in Rome. All of this kind of stuff happened. Rome heavily persecuted the Christians. Yet, despite that, the Christians never fought back, they never took up arms, and the gospel continued to flourish, continued to grow, even at the tip of a sword. As people were dying, as people were martyred for their faith, people saw the resolution of these people. You read about one of the king, one of the Roman emperors, I can't remember which one, he had this thing where he took Christians and their, Christians and their whole families, and he would throw garden parties in Rome, and he would light his garden parties would burning Christians. He would tie them up and they would be the illumination. The fire of these Christians burning would be the illumination for his garden parties. That's incredible to believe. And if families would gladly, not, well, they would take their, they would allow their children to die alongside them. And when people saw that, the fact that these people were willing to die for their faith, that's why Christianity continued to grow despite that. So Paul, Paul's missionary journeys is a diagram you can pull up this map. But Paul had three main missionary journeys. He started and he worked throughout Turkey and over into Greece. And ultimately, his final missionary journey that we read about is actually not really a missionary journey. He's a prisoner. He leaves and heads over to Rome. He spends time in Rome testifying to the Roman in, in the Caesar's palace. There's a bit of conjecture about whether or not he died in Rome. We don't know for certain. There is some evidence that he was released and went to Spain. But it's not certain. It's outside. It's beyond the biblical account. The book of Acts ends with him as a prisoner in Rome before he goes to trial before Caesar. So you see one man, he took people with him, but he, he had significant influence throughout most of Europe. This one man was, was so instrumental, as well as writing so much of the New Testament. He was instrumental in spreading the gospel uh, throughout Europe. So despite the fact that people were martyred for their faith, within 300 years... The Roman Empire fell to Christianity, which is incredible. They weren't, they weren't forcing themselves upon people. They, they were dying at the end of the sword, and yet the Roman Empire, 300 years later, falls. And so what we have is, um, in 313, uh, Constantine, Emperor Constantine, who was a Roman emperor, um, or another word for Caesar, he was called the emperor, he converted to Christianity. And uh, as a process of that, he instituted what's called the Edict of Milan, which basically allowed for religious tolerance. He didn't legalize, He didn't legislate Christianity as the sole religion. He just allowed people to worship whatever they wanted to worship. And uh, so Christianity became a tolerated religion at that point. He also instituted the Council of Nicaea, where he got all the church leaders together, and they had a big council meeting, and that's where we get the Nicene Creed came out of that, which is still used in the Anglican Church, the Catholic Church. We use it in our church. We believe in God, the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, and the Lord of virgin birth, and true God, God of God, and true God of light of light. And you Anglicans know it better than I do. Um, 
you know, almost the, basically the foundational beliefs of the Christian faith came from this meeting that he instituted. And they sat down and they worked out what are the doctrines that, we, that matter to us, the doctrine of the Trinity and so on. Salvation all came out of that. And then his descendant, um, I can't think of his name now, his descendant took over in 380 and he actually went a step further and he legislated that Christianity was the sole religion. All other religions would be outlawed. And if you were to practice another religion, you would be killed. That is where things started to get worse. I mentioned this in over Anzac, the Anzac Day thing yesterday. The Christian message has never been to tell people what they have to do. The Christian message has been to respect people, allow people to have their free choice, not to tell them. By all means, coerce, encourage, share the gospel. But we don't violate human will. And that's what the problem was. From then, things started to go downhill when Christianity became the state religion. It because what happened then was it was suddenly profitable to become a Christian. So anybody who wanted to be profit, anyone who wanted to profit, would call himself a Christian. About 300 years later, we see the rise of Islam. And uh, Muhammad was the founder of that. And he originally thought that the Jews and the Christians would agree with him. He claims a lot of the... He claims to know a lot about the Jewish faith and the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. So Islam basically swept across throughout Turkey and conquered Turkey within a very short period of time. Within 100 years, they had conquered all of northern Africa and all through Turkey. In fact, they, they within 30 years, they conquered Turkey after Muhammad's death. He basically, in his time, he, he, he took all of Saudi Arabia and made it all Islamic. Within 30 years, they've conquered Turkey, and then they, they conquered all of Israel, all of northern Africa in, in 100 yeah, years. And then south of Spain. Yeah, into the south of Spain. Yep, yeah. basically they conquered the south of Spain. There's still heritage there, That's right. Muslim heritage there, but that was where they were pushed back. They were going to try, they couldn't get in through the north, so they wanted to come up through the south and take Europe that way. So that's what the Crusades were about. So in this period of time, there, there's basically the Crusades were the Roman Catholic Church, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Empire, pushing back. So they, would ra they raised their own soldiers to push back against the Islamic soldiers. And so the Crusades lasted. The main Crusades took place during this period of time here, but really there were fights between uh, the Ottoman Empire, the Turks, and the Christians up until about the 17th century, 18th century, so for a long time. During that time, we have the Protestant Reformation. So in 1517, Martin Luther, who was a Catholic, he got a revelation that the Catholic Church weren't teaching about grace. They were teaching that you, to be saved, you had to do all this stuff. You had to be good. You had to, you know, walk old ladies across the street. That wasn't what I was saying, but all these things you had to do. Martin Luther taught that salvation is by grace, so he rebelled against that in 1517. In 15, he started the Lutheran Church and basically started what we call the Protestant Reformation. So basically, the Pro a Protestant church is any church that isn't a Catholic. We are Protestants, Anglicans are Protestants. Everybody who's not Catholic is Protestant. Church of England was formed in 1534, and apologies to the Anglicans. Does anybody know why the Catholic, why the Church of England was formed? Henry That's right. He wanted to kill off one so he could marry another one. Okay. Basically, he wanted to divorce one. He wanted to divorce Anne Boleyn, I think, so he could marry one of the others. And the, 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 the Pope said, no, you can't. So he said, well, stuff you. I'm going to start my own church. Then I can do what I want. So that's how the Anglican Church started. Not really the best grounds for the beginning of the church, but that's where it began. Um, so the Church of England was formed. A couple hundred years later, we have the First Great Awakening, which is a like a revival took place. This one happened largely in the UK. The Second Great Awakening, which is about 80 years later, takes place in the UK and across, they, from the UK, they go across to, the, to America to what is New England, the, which is the northern area around Wash, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, New York, uh, Boston, to the northwestern, northeastern part of the United States. The Second Great Awakening it was a great revival. This is when the Wesleys were around, Charles Wesley, all these, these guys during the Awakening period. A great revival throughout the Americas. And then the Pentecostal movement took place in 1900, began in 1900, and has continued ever since. Um, uh, and that was the really en masse, the returning of the baptism and the Holy Spirit to the church, the teaching around baptism and the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and all that began during that time. And then this bit's a little bit like, this is my own wording down the bottom here, the reunification of the Western Church. I will be, I'll remain to be seen, so you can write, this is just Rowan's prediction, but it seems to me that in the last, probably the 2000s, but probably even in the last 10 years, there seems to be a new move taking place. Certainly, in, in probably about half the time I've been a Christian, 
when I became a Christian, and some of you were Christians in the 90s as well, there was a big disparity between the Protestants and the Pentecostals. Pentecostals were regarded as the wacky ones with no theology, and the Protestant and the Pentecostals regarded the Protestants and the evan we call them evangelicals as being dry and no spirit. There is a reunification taking place. The fact that Pentecostalism has lost some of its extremes, and evangelicals have picked up the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I think Alpha, the Alpha movement had a lot to do with that. Anglicans start starting to teach about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And what has happened is we've gone from extremes of weird Pentecostalism and extremes of um, super dry theologic, theological evangelicalism into the middle. And the large portion of the Christian church is, is middle of the road now. Hillsong is regarded as middle of the road. Yeah, in middle of the road. There are still people at both extremes, but they are dying away. There is definitely a reunification taking place. There's not the differences that there used to be. And I think that will continue. And I think that's a good thing. We're nearly done. And we'll have some questions. If you need to go, you can. We're going to look at the end times. So we're in the church age. There'll come a time in the end, the end times. Now, people ask, how does this whole thing of Jesus healing work when we've got you know sickness and we're still seeing it? This is a simple picture of how it all, it all works. We currently live in between the first coming and the second coming of Jesus. In this period of time, there is an overlap between the fallen world, the sinful world, and the kingdom world. Of God that is yet to come. The, G- the kingdom came at this point because do you remember Jesus? What did he say when he started ministering? What was his first words? The kingdom of heaven is among you. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is among you. Jesus kept talking about the kingdom. The entry point of the kingdom of heaven joining the fallen world happened when Jesus came. Okay? But we are in an overlap stage at the moment because Jesus has not come back to overthrow the enemy yet. He's gone to heaven and he will come back. And we're in a stage, the church age in the middle here, where we are able to access this kingdom, but we still fight this kingdom. That's why Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer, you need to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done yeah. on earth as it is in heaven. We're in this phase. So when we don't see breakthrough yet, doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It's just that we are called to appropriate this, but we'll never fully appropriate this until after the second coming, until the devil is completely dealt with. That will take place at the second coming. So what, what about the current dead in Christ? This is, I'm going to, well, in the next few minutes, I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview. There is some conjecture around this. This is, this is my theory. Some of it is definite. Some of it is probably pretty, pretty sure. Other people will beg to differ on some things, but the, the important thing. So don't, you don't have to take everything on board I, I say, but some of it will make sense. The current dead in Christ, those who die at the moment, what happens to them? Well, the scriptures tell us that they are with the Lord. They're not resurrected yet. They don't have resurrected bodies. Their spirits are with the Lord. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. They are with the Lord, but still waiting for their resurrected body. I've kind of put this in a chronological order as I understand it. There will come a time in the future when what we call the rapture will take place. Now, as we head closer to the end times, whenever that happens to be, whether that's this week or in 100 years from now or whatever, Things will get weird again. There's things, weird things will happen. We're living in a we're living in a time that's not that weird. But the rapture will take place. The rapture seems to indicate that in an instant, every Christian will disappear off the planet. We'll be taken to, to be with the Lord. We'll just be caught up. Paul says, in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, we'll all be changed. We'll be caught up into the air, up to up to heaven, to be with Jesus. And uh, we'll be. At that time, we'll, there'll be others who'll be left behind who weren't following the Lord. There'll be all kinds of things. Just imagine what will happen when every Christian disappears. What about people flying planes, driving cars, all that kind of stuff? You know, it, havoc on the earth, right? So that's the rapture. We don't know when it will happen, but it could happen at any instant. At that point, uh, we'll be judged. So believers will actually sit before a beam of seat, which is a judgment for rewards. Our actions will be judged for levels of reward in the life to come. God will look and go, this is what I had, this is the plan I had for your life. How did you measure up with the plan I had? And the degree we measure up with the plan that God had for our life is the degree of reward we will have. I think I mentioned this recently in church. We'll all get we'll all be in the stadium, we'll all be in the arena, but whether we sit in front row or back row is dependent on how we conduct our lives. That's why we should live godly lives. We're saved, yes, but it's important. It does affect eternity. So during that time, we get raptured. And then sometime after that, a period that the Bible calls the tribulation. It's 
Daniel's 70th week. If you want to write down there, this is the prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 that I referred to earlier, this very important prophecy. There's one week about Israel because the 70 weeks, 70, 70 years, 70 groups of seven years that, that Daniel has a prophecy about, 69 of those weeks have happened, but there's a 70th week yet to happen. It's called the Great Tribulation. It's a period of time where there is horrible hardship for the people of Israel but also a great revival. It's during that time that the Antichrist will reign. Antichrist does not mean, um, he's, it does mean he's against Christ, but it just means another Christ, a false Christ, a being who will arise and rule the world. He'll be the world leader. He's called the beast in the book of Revelation. He's called, uh, he's regarded as all kinds of other names he's given in scripture, but there's definitely a person, a man, who will rise and lead the world at that time. After that seven year period of time, and I've, abbreviated everything that will happen in that seven years very quickly, Jesus will return to the earth and overthrow the Antichrist, defeat him and um, and uh, bring about these things. The Battle of Armageddon, which is a final battle that takes place where Antichrist and his, uh, his, his nations, his followers, lay themselves against the people of God and Jesus will fight for the Jews, for Israel at that time and overthrow them. Then there will be judgment on the Antichrist and his followers People who are alive, people who are alive at that time when that happens, and still alive after seven years of tribulation, historically the Bible seems to indicate it will be about a quarter of the people who were alive at the rapture. A quarter of them will be alive at the end. Um, they will enter into the millennium. The millennium is a thousand-year reign of Christ, where He will actually reign on the earth. During that period of time, Satan is bound, and He is not able to influence the earth. Jesus reigns in Jerusalem. The saints reign alongside him. What that looks like, I don't know. Um, but he is the king ruling over all the world during that time. There is a temple that will be built. Ezekiel has eight, nine, nine chapters about this temple um, that, are, that all refer to this temple that will take place in the millennium. It's very different to the other temples. Nine chapters is a significant amount of the Bible. Referring to it, it gives instructions about what the man, man will look like, how it is to be divided up, what the temple will look like, during that time of that thousand years. If it wasn't for that thousand years, that stuff in Ezekiel makes no sense whatsoever. At the end, it says, of that thousand years, Satan is released, and there is another battle. So people are living in uh, a pe living under the reign of Christ, alive for long periods of li their life. They have long lives during that time. They're reigning under the, the, the kingdom of God. They've got the most godly ruler they could possibly expect. And the devil is still able to deceive them and turn them against them. So people will still turn against Christ after a thousand years of peaceful reign. And there will be this battle called the Battle of Gog and Magog, whatever that means. There will be this great battle at the end, and that will be the end of... That'll be enough. Jesus will say, that's enough. He takes the devil. He throws him into a place called Gehenna, which is outer darkness. Jesus talks about being thrown into outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't have time to go through the doctrines of hell, heaven and hell and how it all fits together now. Um, but it's not just one place. There are multiple places. So he takes Satan and throws him into outer darkness. Um, he opens up the Lamb's Book of Life and looks to see if our names are written in there. If they are, we enter into eternity. If they don't, they're banished to Gehenna. And that is what we call the end of the age. At that point, it seems that time seems to exist. We enter into eternity. There's a new heavens and a new earth. I don't know what that looks like. We're not supposed to know. We know we just get pictures of it, but we don't really know. And then from that point on, believers enjoy eternity. Eternity is not just an endless extension of time. Eternity is the absence of time. Eternity does not mean forever and ever and ever. So despite the fact we sing Amazing Grace when 10,000 years have come and gone, we'll have no less days. Eternity doesn't mean that. Eternity is the eternal now, living outside of time, like God. It's what eternity is. And that is the end.